notion of costs, uh, and then there's a very broad notion of what you can do, and, the, and then there's a cost to effort trade-off there. Uh, you can also think about at a systems level, you know, what are the things you want to do at the edge, uh, somewhere in between at the cloud. And once again, you know, there's a standard trade-off in computer systems or computer architecture. What are the things you want to migrate to a very low level or to the hardware versus, say, the software, which in this case would be the cloud? Uh, so that's another fundamental trade-off you could think about. Um, <coughs> Also, very intimately related is what are the things you want to do uh, in real time? And the two of our speakers this morning emphasized real time aspects. Uh, and then how real should real time be? You know, real time is 10 milliseconds or two seconds? And once again, there's a slew of trade-offs there. So the, the central theme of this panel is going to be uh, for I'll be requesting each of the panelists to focus on one or two key trade-offs which, which is close to their heart and what and their thoughts and guidance as to how to best resolve those trade-offs uh, at two stages. One is given the current uh, technology and state of the art, and also, you know, as these problems are being solved, you know, the trade-off points are going to move. So, you know, what do they uh, foresee? Would the key trade-offs be, you know, three, four years down the road? So for the students out here in the audience, you know, so the good PhD thesis is when you graduate, that's when the topic starts becoming hot. Okay, so for you guys, I think the three to four years uh, is, is also going to be very uh, particularly useful. So um, let me just introduce the uh, panelists in um, alphabetical uh, last name order. Uh, so we have uh, Vijay Bhagavat, and uh, Vijay is uh, a VP at, uh, uh, at uh, Deutsche Bank, and he's the analyst for this space, which is wireless and communications. He's actually one of the co-authors of the report that Brian made, Modoff showed in the beginning of this uh, uh, um, summit. And uh, he has a, a variety of interests and capabilities. He's taught, like us, at uh, Steve, Steven Tech, NGIT. Uh, he's an inventor. He has 22 patents. And of course, he's an equity analyst as well. So I think that gives a very you know, broad perspective uh, to the panel. Um, and then we have Tom Bradichich, uh, who's uh, with National Instruments. He's come there after an extremely distinguished career at IBM. Uh, so he is the systems person at IBM. You know, any IBM award you can think of, IBM fellow, IBM distinguished engineer, and so on, he's, he's got that. Uh, and he's interested in end-to-end, -end, building end-to-end -end systems. Um, and he might be talking about the big bad data. So bad is big analog data. And actually, once I saw that acronym, I thought maybe we should, the panel should be, is big data bad? <laughs> uh, and then you can take take it any way you want. But he'll definitely be talking about the uh, analog uh, aspects of uh, side of big data. Uh, then we have Rodolfo Milito, uh, who, like our first panelist, also has a very varied, versatile career. He had a long, distinguished uh, um, uh, innings uh, at Bell Labs. And after that, he became an entrepreneur. He co-founded a company called Concentry. Uh, and now he's uh, in, with Cisco Systems. Uh, and from talking to him, what I gathered is their uh, group is like a um, future prediction type of group. But they also, rather than just speculate, they also actually do things. So you also build things or find partners to build things with, as well as speculate <coughs> about the future. So that's a very unusual uh, combination to have. Uh, and the finals. Panelist is uh, Dr. Mudhakar Shivasta. So Mudhakar graduated from, did his PhD from Georgia Tech, and he's with IBM TJ Watson. Um, and, and he uh, does research in uh, network systems. So this is a viewpoint from a very research perspective. Uh, and he's also in, involved in several international alliances. There's this alliance for secure hybrid uh, networking and so on. So he, he can also have, uh, bring in perhaps a European uh, perspective uh, to the panel, okay? Uh, so I would request each of the panelists, since you're already sorted in alphabetical order, uh, uh, so to go from, uh, well, my right to left, uh, and perhaps spend six to eight minutes, um, you know, with your thoughts on this. Uh, and then we'll have a free-for-all uh, discussion uh, till we get hungry enough. Okay, 
So yeah, thanks, Joydeep, and uh, great to be here. This is my first time in Austin. I went to, uh, I got my PhD from uh, UTA, University of Texas, almost. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's in good humor, so. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'd like to share with you uh, the networking opportunities in big data. I mean, with all due respect to the big data community, this is my personal view uh, that uh, the big data thinkers and the big data practitioners come from the compute side. I don't know why, maybe that's what it is. So we talk about Hadoop, Big Hive. These seem compute terms. They call services hosts, you know. So I'd like to kind of share with you uh, a fundamental new idea which, you know, Brian Modoff uh, and I are working on to look at the networking opportunities in big data. And let me drill down some key opportunities. These are very interesting the research problems, you know, if you're in graduate school, uh, if any of you are entrepreneurs here, very good startup opportunities for professors, you know, attractive opportunities for getting research grants, doing uh, reports on this, projects on this. So let me start out with a thought. And the thought is we are seeing a fundamental disruption in the world of networking. What I mean by this is we are going from, uh, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of servers to hundreds of thousands of servers. And uh, the motivation behind this is cloud applications such as Google Maps, which in my view needs 450,000 servers to run. There are 40 million virtual machines on the planet. And if you talk to AWS, Amazon, my argument is they would say they have two, two and a half million virtual machines mm -hmm. running at any instant of time. CRM, Salesforce.com, all of the big data analytics, a Walmart or a Procter & Gamble would run, or a Costco, and you always have your favorite NSA. So my, my view is uh, you, you, the networking problems are important, and the networking problems are underappreciated and understudied. I don't know why, and I think it's because it's the habit of the computer science practitioner to look at a problem one level up. This has been the mindset in computing that Somehow, if you take a problem, push it one level above, it becomes easier and tractable. And then I API into everything else. Well, nice try, because you're ignoring the wealth of information that moves around in networks. So I think the fundamental, and I'll go this line by line, the first opportunity in networking is to build out scale out networks. What I mean by this is when we go from tens of thousands of servers to hundreds of thousands of servers, it's very difficult to build networks the manual way. I mean, I know how networks are built. You have a CCIE with CLI, and it takes you know weeks or months to prep this network. And if you're a service provider, it takes years to prep these networks. But then you have you know impatient companies like Google, Twitter, Facebook, who can't wait for a year to build out their networks. So you have to do things in an automated manner. So what's happening in the world of networking is virtual networks are starting to get built out. I mean, Cisco is you know launching in CME next month, which would have. Uh, overlay networks, VMware came out with NSX overlays. So the interesting problems in networking are how do you look at automatically building networks? It's an important problem, and automation is a difficult problem. In my view, it's uh, ideally you know, uh, an NP hard problem, but to, to make it tractable, my view is there is enough analytics that can be uh, exported and extracted and mined through APIs from network switches, network routers, security appliances, so on and so forth, that can be intelligently leveraged to automatically build networking fabrics at the physical level, networking fabrics at the virtual level, you know, build multiple tenants in clouds. So that's one area of opportunity. I, I call it scale-out networks, for lack of a better word. The second problem is to do with performance optimization on the fly. What I mean by this is all of the big web portals, if you notice, I mean, I personally see when I go to Gmail, oops, we are down. Why should it be oops? You know, why cannot you get make it work? So, or you go to, you know, United Airlines, uh, this page cannot be displayed, but I have to take a plane in the next five minutes. It has to be displayed. So where I'm coming from is big data <coughs> analytics are important and instrumental in tweaking networks, tweaking, uh, tweaking application performance on the fly, reprioritizing applications on the fly. I mean, when I was doing my PhD, there were quintillion theses done on quality of service. I would argue 90% of them had zero value. But I think now the value proposition of doing quality of experience, quality of service, application performance optimization on the fly is important. 
And then switching gears to the third important opportunity, I think it's service chaining. So to be consistent with the mobile and wireless theme here, what I mean by this is, let me give you an example. Defining a service for the teenage demographic is close to impossible because it's very difficult to second guess their preferences. What do they like to opt in, opt on? What do they like to download, upload? What are they willing to pay for, perhaps zero? So my view is where service chaining comes uh, handily with the uh, analytics is if you continuously try to analyze their preferences and usage patterns, you can actually define a viable service that has you know, third parties, advertisers, web portals, cloud portals, uh, reverse paying for <coughs> you know, what they do. And you can tweak these services as you go. I mean, Google has this concept of continuous beta. So you can have a continuous beta for defining a service. And then if you run this thing in time, you can actually get a, a practical service, which would ideally uh, you know, appeal to the teen demographic. And then it would evolve over, over time because every demographic has changing preferences. So just to make it short, scale out networking, especially for web and cloud scale op applications, big problem, important problem, startup opportunities, research opportunities, application performance optimization, leveraging big data analytics, important problem, service chaining, creating services on the fly, important problem. Thanks. Thank You know, uh, my, my colleague Vijay mentioned uh, the importance of websites when they go down when you're attempting to uh, address them. I noticed Instagram is down. Uh, <laughs> therefore, let me just describe to you what I had for lunch. <laughs> so most of us are not under 25 and don't know what I uh, just alluded to. <laughs> you just got it. Yeah. I did. <laughs> hey, um, as I speak with you, I am going to uh, do it in a um, analog measured time frame of about 480 seconds. And uh, as I speak with you, um, uh, several trillion uh, shifts of radiation will take place with the cesium atom, an analog event. And I will transmit to you analog information using uh, images and light and sound, and your eardrum will vibrate, another analog event. And you'll keep comfortable with the wind flow or the airflow of the uh, AC units and the slight vibrations in the vents, uh, analog events. You know, happening. You'll see me with the light. You'll see my motion, analog event. Uh, the comfort you'll enjoy will be driven by voltage, current, analog events. So you see where I'm going here with, uh, you know, with this notion. Then you'll become bored with what I say, and you will apply pressure, an analog event, to your cell phone and begin to process <laughs> texts and emails. And you will launch them somewhere, right, with one or three or more radios, Bluetooth, you know, wireless or cellular. Again, you know, analog events. And um, speaking of that, real quick, at IBM, I was able to um, uh, observe a phenomenon called the, uh, the PTE, the process text and emails. That unit of measurement, by the way, is inversely proportional to the interest of the speaker. And the inverse proportion holds with respect to the authority of the speaker. So in business, when the boss came in, it would, uh, it would go down significantly regardless of whether he was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, I was in a meeting at one time, 13 people were doing their email while the speaker was, uh, was speaking. Anyway, as I move on here in this uh, 480 seconds, um, this is all a particular type of data that's different from what my colleagues are talking about today and maybe likely will for the rest of the day. It is a um, data we call big analog data, and it is everywhere. Uh, it is older than all the other big data we talk about. I would assert that because regardless of your position, if you believe in the Big Bang, that was an analog event, as so, so Joy Deep uh, called it today. Or, or contrary-wise, um, and I quote, God said, let there be light at the beginning of the universe. That is an analog event, you know, as well. It is faster than all the other big data, and I think that's easy when you consider image and light and the spin of electrons that are happening in every atom in your body. Analog it's events, quantum. right? It's quantum. I'm sorry? It's quantum. Yes, as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so thank you for taking up uh, some of my 480 seconds. <laughs> I was quiet during your... <laughs> but at least he's agreeing with me, and I didn't agree with everything you said, so I, I just want you to know I restrained uh, myself. Uh, just by the way, I would add a V called uh, visibility to the five Vs because of the distributedness of what you said, you know, as well. That's, that's for free. You can use that. <laughs> it is bigger if you consider, again, the quantum effects, the angular momentum of the electrons in your body. 
in this room, in this city, in this planet, in the universe, it is bigger, I am asserting, it is bigger than all the other big data combined. That's what I'm saying. That's the world I live in, big analog data. This is a very special type of data. And let me give you some specifics. And I want you to think about the cumulative effect of these, this data as we, uh, you know, as we go on. If we look at a month's time, um, we have customers, this is real world, taking place like a lot of what we're talking about today, that collect five terabytes a month, it, measuring smart grids or measuring turbines, for example, that generate power. Now that accumulates up five terabytes, you might say, you know, that's not big data, but uh, it accumulates. We have customers um, measuring a um, uh, in-test measurement in South Carolina collecting 10 terabytes a day. They have a really big data problem. We have customers measuring jet engines when they are in flight or in test, again, 20, as you can see, per hour. Probably the most exciting one is colleagues at CERN, which is, uh, if you might have noticed, is the graphic there, right, with the cyclotrons spinning around. And unlike the Ghostbusters advice, the streams will cross, and then they will discover things such as what? Oh, there's the Higgs boson, right? Um, an analog event for, you know, discovery. They generate 40 terabytes a second, and this accumulates over and over years. I have one customer who said, we are stopped collecting analog data in our experiments. We are going to take the next 15 years and do analytics. <laughs> right. that's, their, that's their plan, so it's, it's pretty profound. So let me move on um, uh, quickly here. A generalized three-tier big analog data solution, and we'll now address wireless and analytics, which is the topic of our panel here, uh, can be looked at like this. It is all about, as you said, the data. And we have portioned the data into five phases, which are on the bottom there, from the sensors in Tier 1 moving to Tier 2, which are DANs, uh, an acronym for Data Acquisition Analysis Systems and Nodes that are networked, and they scale out, and then they go to traditional IT. Real time, as you can see, in motion, early life. There's value in all those levels doing analytics. If you'd like to know if your asset is being monitored, it's going to catch on fire, you want real-time analytics taking place. You don't have time to even move to a server to get this information, some of this. And if you're adjusting the stream of electrons, right, in an experiment, you don't have time for it to get that way. <clears throat> Contrary-wise, you might want on the other side uh, of the, pull out archive data that's seven years old and compare it to in-motion data and see what's happening during a, uh, a particular event where a crowd is moving or something, again, an analog effect, or not even an analog effect as well. But this solution, you know, this approach is interesting in that um, my colleagues will talk about T0 of data starting in real time right there. That's common for big data. It's when it hits a switch, usually comes off of a, uh, of a NIC somewhere, it gets into a switch, then it goes into a hard drive, right, and then from that analytics start, that's called in motion or real. In my world, that's really old. That's super, super old <laughs> data because right here is where T0 starts, the point of capture of this analog a phenomenon. And again, think about one of these. Um, there's at least, um, I don't know, eight or nine analog phenomenon that has to be tested before it leaves the line. Um, do you think the manufacturer wants that thing out fast? Yes. Why? Because if you were ever to look at the night before an announcement of an Apple product in front of an Apple store, what do you see? You have hordes of people, including my son, waiting all night, right, to be the early adopter. And therefore, can you test this in, you know, five minutes? Now can you test it in two? Now can you test it in 20 seconds? You know, getting that speed out is a very commercial value. And um, the wireless dimension of this is, in my world, is really, really, really slow in my world. And this is the trade-offs, you know, that we're making. So analytics, and I, and I portion them into three categories. Uh, there's both engineering and scientific, which are obvious from this analog phenomena. But there's tremendous business insight to be derived. So the time to insight, and then the time from insight to decision, in a business, in a commercial operation is the key here. It's all about the data and being able to insightfully pull from it. So wireless here and wireless here. There are two areas of wireless as we get to our topic that we'll talk about. And uh, I realize the profundity of what I'm saying lies not in the fact that I pointed out there are two bottlenecks in the solution. That's pretty straightforward. But rather in the things we're doing to solve them, right? And that will be the way I would set up our panel discussion, you know, as well. Increase CPU and memory capability there for data decimation analytics and then of course smart sensors that move the analysis back here so you have to you know shift you know less and less so with that I believe I'm out of time and uh, am I allowed to do this uh, talk about other things coming up um, okay good a couple of big data things all nonprofit by the way coming up and um, I think you're posting these slides if you care to go to these uh, to this as well okay very good 
I will now uh, defer to the the gentleman from Cisco. Yeah. Well, it's very refreshing to hear Vijay talk about the network. Um, really, five years ago, I did, uh, at that point, cloud computing was coming on board, and it was kind of funny. I mean, m in many events, I mean, the network was totally absent in the discussions. And if you brought them up, people look at you and say, what are you talking about? <laughs> anyway, that's... And thank you, Tom. I mean, you're, you are bringing something that resonates very much with things I'm going to say. Uh, this event is, let me make sure that I start this so I don't go overboard. Uh, this event, I mean, is fantastic. I mean, I have enjoyed so far uh, all the presentations and all the discussions. So l let me give an angle that is complementary, not opposed, but complementary to many of the things that have been said. The first question I have is this. I want to talk about IoT, Internet of Things, and you will see why. Internet of Things really comes from the convergence of two phenomena. On the left, we have IP networks really expanding beyond the original Internet. I mean, there have been islands so far of using IP because of the productivity in, uh, increase and all that. And on the right, we have the phenomenal advances in wireless. <coughs> I mean, and we have had a lot of conversations already on that. Now, as a result of that, we converge into a world of trillion of endpoints. And this is the interesting piece there, and I will remark on that later, is that the internet meets the physical world. I mean, DARPA started the term cyber physical systems years back. Uh, this is my favorite thing. Really, is the internet just not communicating messages, but really interacting physically with the physicality of the world. Now, uh, I claim that we go through, we are going through a momentous transition. Today, we have two to three billion endpoints. I don't know how many, really. Uh, in 2025 or so, we will have one trillion. So the first point is, we have a scalability problem, don't we? And we have a connectivity problem. And the obvious answer is yes, we do have that. But there is more than that. And the point I want to remark because to me this is a fundamental piece, is today what we have is, on the left, we have a, almost in every case, almost behind every endpoint, like a smartphone or a tablet, we have a person. As we move to IoT, those sensors will not be, are not being individually connected to the cloud. What we are going to see, and we are already seeing, are systems integrated, I mean, in which we have sensors and actuators. If you want to call them a, a mega or a, a, a macro endpoint, be it. But a connected car has many sensors and actuators within itself. And we cannot just throw the numbers by a trillion or one trillion, two trillion, and claim that that's the problem. Oh, is it better? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the, the issue is, in this new world, we need to think about, not in individual terms, but we need to think in, as a system what we are doing. What we are doing or want to do in oil and gas, in a smart city, smart grid, etc., etc., And so that requires a system view. And that brings a number of new challenges, opportunities, and there are very important implications for big data and analytics that I will go briefly uh, on. In the first place, we have a very large number of geo-distributed sources. 
I will elaborate a little more on that. In many cases, we need actionable analytics in real time. We need to make decisions and act and close valves when there is a leak, right there. And uh, then there is a lot that puts a lot of um, load on data management at the edge. And for this, there is some, a concept I want to introduce you to, which we call fog computing. Fog, well, of course, I live right now in Northern California, so I'm very familiar with fog. That's the Golden Gate. You barely see it. It's submerged in the fog. And fog is not nothing, it's, it's not something negative. Redwoods live because of the fog. In an almost desertic climate, you need that humidity. Anyway, that's a side comment. But what is fog? Fog is a non-trivial extension of cloud computing. Cloud is immensely successful and is here to stay, no doubt. The idea is that some of the cloud computing capabilities have to be extended to the edge for, to support applications that require fast mobility, fast as in a train or a car, that support distributed, geographically distributed applications and large scale control distributed systems. So, just, I am, must be very close. Uh, so, this is complementary. It's not intended to <laughs> substitute what has been said before, but people characterize and I agree with Alex, I mean, I don't necessarily like that classification, but uh, big data as volume, velocity, variety, and veracity, I, had for, I forgot the 4V. Well, I want to add another concept, another dimension, which is the geo-distribution. To me, that is something emerging that we need to pay attention to. And it has a different character. I mean, uh, today, I mean, we have mentioned Hadoop a number of times in a very good way, because I agree with the statements that have been made about Hadoop. I mean, the value and the, the con they have been put in context. Analysts went overboard with Hadoop, in my opinion, mm -hmm. in the past, and associated everything that is big data, oh, is Hadoop. I mean, those are two different concepts, right? And the, the point is that if we have a multiple sources of data distributed geographically, the problem is not the Hadoop problem. It's, it's a different thing that we need to handle. And for that, we, what I claim we need is a platform that is hierarchic, first distributed, of course, has compute networking and storage capabilities at the edge, but also is organized hierarchically and also interacts with the cloud. Because big data, and yesterday we had a wonderful conversation with Joy Deep on that, data has different time scales. There are time scales, uh, there is, I don't have time for that, but essentially in, in grid, in the smart grid, for instance, you see things that are actionable in milliseconds at the level of machine-to-machine -machine interactions that need to take place, particularly now with alternative sources of energy and all that, all the way up to the cloud in which you store data that comes from years and you have to be, make predictions about the economy, about where to get um, sources of energy and all so on. So I, I hope I conveyed some of these disruptions that I see coming and that we need to pay attention to. All right, uh, I'm, I'm going to be giving uh, some perspective on uh, security and big data, or as earlier, Thassos called it as the, the elephant in the room. Uh, but I'd like to share some thoughts on uh, security and privacy aspects related to big data. Uh, scrolling back a little bit in time, uh, I will start off with this report called the JSON report, which appeared, uh, which was published by MITRE, uh, M-I-T-R-E. 
uh, they looked at uh, intelligence analysts uh, who were analyzing data from uh, various data sources. Uh, the classical access control model that's used there is uh, what is known as a multi-level security access control model. Let me oversimplify it by saying that there are four different labels called unclassified, classified, secret, and top secret. A document or a piece of information is annotated with one of these four labels. When an analyst derives an information from document one and document two, he has to associate the derived document with a label which is the max of the input documents. For example, if I derive some information out of a secret document and a classified document, the derived information becomes secret, for example. The observation that they pointed out was that starting with a corpus of information, uh, look at these analysts processing this data over a period of time, in just a couple of weeks, over 90% of the data becomes marked as at least secret or top secret. Essentially, what happens is that very soon nobody can access any of this result of analytics. I mean, you do all this fascinating analytics at really high speeds, but very soon the classification level goes up that you cannot rely upon your uh, access control models any longer. So what happens is that the access control model defaults from an automated system to a manual system where, you know, I go up the ladder, request my uh, whatever, whoever I'm reporting to their permission, maybe it escalates one level higher. So it, it results in a several days of latency uh, to get access to a relevant piece of information because of this, uh, the way uh, security is set up. So what they pointed out is the need for security to be more agile. I mean, data analytics is really becoming very, very agile nowadays. There is really uh, talks about things that are happening at several terabytes per second. Uh, you really can't, uh, uh, security is becoming an impediment in the process, so there was a need to essentially make security a lot more agile than what it is today. So since then, uh, several folks have been uh, advocating these uh, risk-based models of security. Essentially, what it means is walking the fine line. So there is this trade-off between utility and security or privacy of data, and you have to walk this fine line one way or the other. So to walk this, walk this fine line, essentially what is required is a price tag. You know, we have been very effective in putting a price tag on, say, a shoes, a purse, a shirt. We even put price tags on more esoteric and intangible items like car insurance. We can put a price tag on a human life in the form of life insurance. But it's somehow, uh, while uh, we have mastered the art of putting price tag on so many other things, it has been somewhat challenging to put a price tag on a piece of information. It's at times mind-boggling that we can put a price tag on human life but not on a piece of information just as easily. So there are at least uh, three different reasons that people point out as to why this could be the case. Uh, the first is uh, what is known as the join problem or the fear of the unknown. Um, to explain that problem, I'll give you a very simple example. Let's suppose you have one database which has, uh, uh, say, it's, it's, on the, it's a census data, population of the U.S. One database has, say, age, sex, and some identifier, and another database has, um, say, zip code and identifier. Now, individually, these databases are known to not have any unique identifying capability, meaning there will be several people who have uh, very similar characteristics in terms of, say, just... Uh, the name, the, the age, and the sex, or in terms of the zip code. But if you can join this data together, the triplet, meaning the age, the sex, and the zip code, can uniquely identify about 60% of the U.S. population. So this is, the, this is the join, or the fear of the unknown problem, because I might think that the zip code data is not very sensitive, but how do you know that I already have the other piece of data or not? Or I might have the, the age and the sex data already, then you sharing me the zip code information, which is joinable with the old table, can result in a significant security breach, and this is the fear of the unknown. The second important problem is, uh, comes from statistical multiplexing. Now, what it means is that uh, traditionally, when you look at, say, building risk models for insurance purposes or, say, car insurance, I don't have to build a very precise model for Vijay, for example. I need to be uh, precise enough for a population of users because I'm insuring, say, a million people or tens of millions of people. So even if I make some mistakes with respect to Vijay's model, as long as the aggregate adds up, the law of large numbers works in our favor, and everything is jolly good. Now, this is almost counterintuitive. With big data, the law of large numbers should be in our favor because we are not talking about millions. We are always talking about billions or uh, uh, even, larger, even larger numbers, which... Uh, as for Alex, doesn't mean anything but for being a very large number. So it should work in our favor, but unfortunately it doesn't. 
because uh, unlike uh, uh, the sort of other insurance models, there's sort of level of statistical independence between me running into an accident versus which I running into an accident, for example. But big data platform, any, as much as it can enable you to process on large data in one go, it can also help you steal large data in one go. So the, the sort of the independence assumption sort of starts to break down when things can be stolen in, 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 in group or in, in bulk quantities. The third problem is the undetectability problem. If, 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 if I am engaged, if I, if, I, uh, uh, if I encounter an accident, I know that I have been in an accident. Uh, if I get hurt, I know that I have, I have been hurt. But if I lose a piece of information, I may or may not know that I have lost a piece of information. So undetectability is another serious problem that uh, arises when it comes to sort of uh, protecting big data. So with, with these three challenges in mind, uh, I'm not going to prescribe any particular solution here, uh, but the outlook has been in terms, of, uh, in terms of enriching your risk models. Enriching your risk models to make them more agile, make them more flexible, so that when the operation demands, you can sort of, uh, so you can sort of telescopically zoom in and zoom out as to how rich of a risk model you want to use versus how much more abstracted model you want to use depending upon time and resource availability constraints. Uh, so with that, I'll... Uh... For our distinguished panels, so I'll, uh, I had a bunch of canned questions, but I think it's better to be agile and spontaneous to the audience here. So, Sanjay? One of the reasons why we cannot uh, price uh, uh, information, whereas we could, uh, was that uh, the join problem, right? Right. But isn't that the same thing true with humans? I mean, I sit next to. Uh, uh, Todd here, and then we collaborate, and something remarkable comes out. Right. But still, you have a life insurance for me, right. as opposed to me and Todd. So it's exactly the same right. thing. No, I, I've heard this example. The classical example I've heard is me being a physicist and you being a computer scientist, and we invent the first working uh, quantum computer, for example. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, that is indeed the case. So that might just mean that we have to sort of better understand those risk models, convert, identify what is the problem in mapping those risk models that come from, say, the insurance or uh, other domains and borrow them into the information world. So this has been easier said than done. So there have been several efforts to get this rolling. Uh, in fact, it's not very clear, in fact, how much the life insurance takes into account that you may be able to collaborate with somebody else and produce enormous amount of information that otherwise would not have been accessible by the two individuals, for example. So this is something that may be a common problem to both information and, uh, and people. But what is different with information is that the cost of joining is very low. Uh, oh, you had a follow-up question. Follow-up was, oh, sorry. Um, in the human context, the price of anybody's life, my insurance, depends only on my health state, not what I can do or what I can't do. Yeah, so it's a socialist assumption. Sorry. You. Probability of life is probability of death. It has nothing to do with the value of Exactly. Life. So that fundamentally points to the need for understanding value of information more than just the probability of death and what my earning potential is today. So you need these new models, you need these newer risk models for information that can capture all this information uh, so that we can handle uh, you know, the sort of security and privacy issues in big data. <coughs> well, uh, I'll comment if there's not a question right away. Uh, I, and maybe you could, maybe this is a question for you. Don't we have a precedence when it comes to somebody stealing information? and the lawsuit ensues, and there's an award, that's the price, right, right. that information. Could that affect, do you think, the, uh, the future of uh, putting price on data and information? Uh, yes, so there is this sort of a feedback loop that you can build in, so, so there are some incidences that happen, some that get reported. In fact, a uh, widely accepted percentage of data losses that are reported is way under 20% because it's a matter of reputation. Some people don't report it. Some people are, are forced to report due to regulatory reasons. Like, for example, if a hospital loses information, it's forced to report due to regulatory HIPAA. HIPAA uh, forces the hospital to report information. So there are, uh, there are some instances of... Trademark copyright infringement. Yes. All put value on information. Yes. So there are all these pieces of, uh, of, uh, of the puzzle that really need to come together. And we cannot, and we have to reason on this, you know, again in real time because 
this unlike the past when I could, uh, you know, you could request a file and I could take all my sweet time to determine whether I should share it with you or not, in things like in, uh, Internet of Things or in terms of the analog data that you are processing, I need to make split second decisions on what I want to share and what I don't want to share. So I need to be able to build these very flexible risk models, evaluate them on the fly with all the updated context information and make a yes or no decision. So, more questions? Okay. So, uh, could, this is for each of you, at least the first three, uh, if there are no other questions. So, could you pick, oh, there is, right behind you, okay. So, you know, so I'm, I'm a wireless guy, not a big data guy. And, you know, I understand the wireless industry and, you know, we've enabled things like iPhones and everything. You know, I've been listening to all the talks this morning. I'm still not I still don't understand fundamentally the business case for big data. I understand how each company can save a lot of money from mining this data. They can keep their customers from churning. I understand how, you know, uh, these uh, companies that insist on storing all this data can save money by storing it with uh, smart codes like Alex is advocating. But I understand how, like, as a consumer, you know, and maybe it makes better recommendations for me uh, for movies or restaurants or anything. But, like, what's the real, like, economic impact of this? Has anyone quantified it? What's the value of this industry? And uh, you know, so it's just a very open-ended, curious question. So we have at least two responses here. You go first. I'll go after you. Yeah, I mean, you know, since Brian and I are in the investment profession, I'd like to share kind of our view. Uh, I think, you know, my, it's a fascinating question. The, the, the business case is the opportunity cost. I think every business case starts with the definition of an opportunity cost. So if you look at building cloud scale networks, in my view, it's close to impossible to build a cloud scale network without some degree of automation. And to have some degree of automation, you need big data analytics. So hopefully that conceptually answers your question. And then if you look at you know, some of these service chaining models, creating services on the fly, if you told a Verizon or an AT&T, you know, have a bulletproof plan for uh, the teenage demographic or for the business demographic, and this actually works, there's a willingness to pay for it. So my view is uh, it's, it's less about the, the value of big data per se, but it's about how big data can be used to solve technically unsolvable problems. I mean, it's very difficult to create the perfect plan for the teen demographic. It's very difficult to build cloud scale networks. It's very difficult to optimize cloud applications on the fly, the Gmail example. And the cost of outage of Gmail or Walmart's big data application is a finite number. So hopefully those answer your questions. Uh, it's also, the, there's also a, a monetization value to this uh, as well. So li like if Starbucks figures out that at 9 a.m. a uh, ton of people drink their expensive beverages, I mean, I'm not one of those, but uh, then they, they, they could actually give a promotion to leverage price elasticity and get more people to drink that expensive beverage. So that's big data at work at a very short time scale. So. That's the, uh, related to the urban legend of the diapers and the beer. I don't know <laughs> if you've heard that one. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, anyway, quantifying, I have a, a real-world example happening now. You may have heard of Duke Energy, one of our customers. They are the largest provider of um, power in the United States. And the business value lies in the fact that they can take an analog phenomenon called a vibration, process that, and with a special type of analytics called prognostics, if there's enough of the data, meaning bigness of it, right, you will get statistical significance. And from that can determine when the asset will fail. And if you can plan an outage, there's tremendous economic benefit than being surprised by it, right? That data is very intriguing. It goes from my world of engineering and analog data into the world of digital business intelligence and budgeting data. It connects two worlds and goes into a report for the next year's budget. And an executive will look at the report and say, ah, I see you have allocated $9 million for a new turbine. Why did you do that? And hopefully they say it's because of us, right? We were able to help them achieve that, you know, as well. But then one more general point, and you, I think if you're in this business, you have an engineering degree, I'm assuming, because those that have them understand what I'm about to say. It's all about statistical significance. And therefore, small data sets limit your conclusiveness. Life is much, much based on probabilities and predictions, right? And therefore, the more data you can have to predict something, the better. And when you sell to a non 
engineer, it's hard to consider that intuitively. It's very subtle what I'm saying in the sales cycle of a, of a solution. But in the world where your customers are engineers, they don't want to, add, they don't ask why should I create more data? They're asking how can I get the insight out of it? You know, because I know it's there. So I'll, I'll let you answer, ask a question. Sure. Ahead of elections, sometimes we can predict what the election results are going to be very, very accurately, even though our sample size is pretty small. So, you know, I think it depends on the context. If if you do it right, uh, you can get very precise answers with not much data. If you know how to sample your data and, and how to, you know, get get uh, the. Oh, there's always that case. I, I would agree with you. Yeah. So it seems to me you imply with your question that cutting costs is not business benefit. I'm not sure if I understand. But you know, if you think about it, you know, humanity uh, progresses by improving productivity. And the way you see productivity increase is as lower cost, right? So at some point, lowering cost has as much business benefit as increasing revenue. It's the same thing. You see exactly the same thing, but from two different perspectives. Yeah, I, I agree. I was I was trying to be a bit uh, inflammatory. I was just uh, you know uh, good, good job, but uh, <laughs> you know it's obviously Can huge economic it? value to yeah. doing these things more efficiently, knowing what you're doing. Um, but I guess you, you know, like when I explain what I do to somebody, I can explain. I do wireless communications. Like you know, they, they, they intuitively there, there's new things, new products that have been enabled that you could not have done without like smarter ways of doing communication. You know, smartphones. You know, all of us using wireless laptops. I mean, what what is we like new th world changing products that we're going to see from big data in 10 years? Yeah. Well, the, I mean, that's a, that's that's a really like, hard question. Like that? <laughs> I'll just turn over here. No, no, no. Go ahead, but I mean, I went to make a comment. Yes. But the, the um, uh, I don't know if you were really just trying to generate the conversation, but there's case after case after case of value from the big data and, and, and also small data. I mean, Ahmed mentioned a binary case, right? So therefore, the smallness and the probability of getting it right is 50-50 without data, right? So the smallness of it is, um, is, is contingent there. But uh, I just want to say, after, if you'd like to talk more about it, I can give you real hard information on this. Go ahead. No, a brief comment about IoT, because I mentioned IoT. I brought it to the picture. And the reality is that IoT is bringing new actors to the scene, I mean, new situations, and I don't think there are many that will generate, that needs to generate new business models. I don't think that there are many new ones yet there. I mean, that, that's a reality. I mean, and that, of course, has to do with the sensors and actuators and the collection. I mean, who many of the things I was mentioning are in the context, one example. I mean, smart traffic light system is a canonical example I put. It's a smart light that detects when cars are approaching at the speed, the velocity, and see a, a, a child crossing the street and sends alarms and things like that. Uh, but that traffic light, of course, is coordinated with the other traffic lights at the other intersections. What is the value that you put to that? Who runs that and who pays for that? Uh, those are things to address. To answer your question about the new technologies, I think that's what you asked. Well, one that is coming is what, what I would call inferential data. Some people call it fuzzy. Some people call it, um, you know, different types of, of, of inf information. But we live in a world of inferences, right? You're making them now about me. It's not explicit who I am, where I come from, but by looking at inferences. And if you have a spouse, you can determine uh, many times the mood the spouse and because you're inferring the posture, the words, etc. This notion of analytics getting more intelligent and being able to infer requires lots and lots of input to be able to do that when the explicit data is, is not there. So uh, there are startups around the world, I assume, I know of a couple that are working on this notion of uh, fuzzy data or inferential data. Yeah, and, you know, I'd just like to add one quick point to your point about, you know, looking at five, ten years from now. This is, you know, my view. Uh, five years from now, we'll see uh, e-health, mobile health, as one of the primary use cases of big data. So in my view, you'll have an opt-in situation where uh, there are people who would not mind their you know, vitals to be monitored and then send wirelessly to uh, their insurance companies or their primary care physicians. And this is my, my view, uh, that if you continuously monitor uh, you know, human vitals every second of the day, every day, uh, a lot of interesting insight and predictive insight 
you know, can be gained that helps the, the person and also helps the supply chain, the hospital. And the, so I think e-health, m-health would be a practical use case. Yeah. Can, can I? Thank you. It's just a more of uh, what we were just uh, brainstorming here, the, Jeff's question. Uh, so what are, you know, new products that come out of big data uh, that are concrete? And, uh, you know, I was, was just thinking about it, and I, I want to say search, right? Search. It's like a little text box. You just type a bunch of stuff. You don't see 50,000 servers <laughs> running in the background. So it's easy to, to, to not think that's a big deal, right? And you wouldn't have that. Or another thing is maps. Right, Google Maps. So you just type, okay, show me traffic, show me how to go there. You just think, oh, come on, it's a little thing, it's running on the phone. You see the phone, you know, right? But you, you don't think there's like 40,000 servers running in the back that allow you to do that. So I think these are very concrete. Well, I'm sure Jeff appreciates that, but he's, he's the, uh, <laughs> No, no, it's easy. <laughs> Well, I'm going to drive home. I can only drive, for example, home uh, because I can use Google Maps, <laughs> right? <laughs> Otherwise, I get lost. <laughs> so I think, I think that that is, for example, has already disrupted. I mean, of course, there will be more. But I'm, all I'm saying is it's very easy to forget how big a deal and how non-trivial it is to have search and maps and how much that relies on highly non-trivial infrastructure. Yeah, fair point. I would say Siri is of debatable value. <laughs> well, Jeff, the, right. we stand between you and lunch. We pray the rain will be held back, and we'll be reconvening here at 1.15 for the afternoon session, which will focus more on location and big data. Okay, great. And I'd also like to thank our panelists once again for the insights. Thank you. Okay. Very good. This, I think, is very interesting. I actually just uh, no, no, got a yeah, 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 yeah. business school. They have a hiring department. Yeah, right. I, I really enjoyed that, yeah, I uh, and I enjoyed sorry. yours uh, tremendously. So I was just, you know, trying to make. No, no, yeah, yeah. I, 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 that was great. Amen. Thanks. 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 Hello again. How are you? Thank you for making this connection. For you. That's why I tried to think of you. For getting our message out. Thank you. Let me also discuss picking up on like the WPP. They could say look a little bit at the flash. Go to which bank. Go to the table. Next year, the table. That's what we got to do. So we'll have like late on 2014 is another communication spot. It'll be here in Austin. Yeah. I think this exact panel is right. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. there are codes yeah, that, 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 that allow you to save that. Spend a lot of time on this. Uh, in, in most of the, and, uh, you are we're also closing business around so many companies. I am using it. I don't. I am using it. But I'm also working in ice. So. Hey. Hey. If you have a card, uh, nice to meet you. I, I can find you. Yeah, we have met. Have you find me? No, this is personally. I sent you an email before the meeting. I would like some time, you know, you have some minutes, you know, I would like to maybe sit down with you and show you something that I've been working for some time. I think, yeah, and, uh, and how and I actually, huh? No, I, I, I mean, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's very exactly. Yes, yeah. 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 You're here in Austin, so we can have lunch. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. So am I. There are many Maybe things yeah. that. Yeah, I'm sure your email's there. I really feel bad. I like no, to, that's fine. That's fine.
Thank you.
Uh, yeah, way back when. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Leslie Nielsen moment. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed lunch. Our afternoon program is hosted by the Rock. I just wanted to give our sponsors a little love. Uh, first, we'll hear from Sunwear. Uh, then we'll hear from our afternoon keynote speaker. After which we'll have uh, John B. Berger, then another break and a panel session, and then we'll close up uh, with two other great speakers. So I'll turn it over to Kyle, who will uh, introduce our, our next speaker. Thank you, Kyle. Welcome back. Uh, I think uh, we might be doing some exercises here in a few seconds, so you guys, uh, you guys get ready. Uh, I say that in, in partly in jest, but uh, uh, the, the next speaker is uh, it's a pleasure to be able to introduce him. Uh, prior to uh, many things, I'm going to uh, uh, elucidate here in a minute. Uh, our uh, our guest was a captain in the uh, in the armed forces in the army. Uh, he was an army ranger and uh, army airborne. So uh, we may be uh, maybe up for some uh, surprise <coughs> sessions. We'll be back after that uh, post lunch uh, doldrums. But uh, Alan uh, is a, uh, we call them serial entrepreneurs. He's not in the grains business and doesn't care about what you eat for breakfast, but he starts companies. And uh, he's, he's done it multiple times. He sold companies to the likes of Cisco, uh, ISS, which has then been bought by IBM in the security space, uh, and Level 3 Communications. Uh, this is maybe his fourth. I'm sure there's probably more in there too, but this is a, a startup that we're going to hear a little bit about. And, and it, I say startup tongue-in-cheek. This, this company is by no means a startup any longer. I've uh, been part of the Austin uh, mobile technology team for, uh, for quite some time. And we're going to hear a little bit about, uh, about their, their endeavors. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alan Nikowski from Funware. Great. Thank you. All right, while he's pulling that up, uh, anyone in here heard of Funware before? Oh, wow, I'm excited. Now we've got some more. <laughs> yes. So uh, Funware was uh, set up with a really interesting, ambitious goal in life. So there's hardware, there's software, there's firmware, and we wanted there to be Funware, uh, a mobile overlay to the planet. So we had the ambitious idea, if you assume that we went through a communications revolution years ago, now we're in a mobile revolution, we wanted to arm humanity to engage, manage, and monetize every connected device on the planet. And genuinely mean that, not just a big idea. But we want to reach out and we've built systems to go out and touch every human being on Earth with a connected device. Uh, we ended up doing a lot of interesting things to address this. And I want to talk about uh, a little bit of the big data and the location-specific component of it in a little bit different way. Because a lot of what we do would fit sort of layer seven. Think of the application or intelligence services layer. And Funware now has grown quite a bit. So it started with a few of us. We'll be five years old in uh, February. Uh, we actually are up to a little over 150 people uh, recently over the weekend. It's been like the dream week for me. So I'm so excited that you have no idea. Uh, I got to go with my wife up to Washington, DC. We were Inc. number 40 on their Inc. 500 fastest growing companies in America list. I think we were number four on the software side. Uh, right before that, we got to go to some of the CXO awards and get to collect some things on behalf of a wonderful employee base and investor team that's been so generous to us. And then uh, we actually had even more things happen. Last night, I got to go to the Austin Business Journal Awards. And uh, we were ranked number one out of the fast 50 for that. And you almost feel like it gets to be surreal. Uh, the most important thing, I'll share something personal found out great news today. Uh, my wife found a, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, my wife found a lump. Uh, we've been married for 18 years. We have four kids. Uh, and we were terrified because this morning she had to go do a, a sort of a mammogram of sorts. And fortunately, they found out it was a calcium de deposit, not cancer. So we're going to drink heavily later because we were quite worried. <laughs> uh, so thank you. <laughs> So the scale that we're going to talk about today is that this is actually now outdated. We're growing so fast that uh, we had to migrate off of AWS because uh, it's cost inefficient when you start approaching a trillion transactions. Uh, this year, we're probably going to go through a trillion transactions, about 800 billion in the mobile cloud. We have 12 modules that solve everything you need to succeed on mobile. Uh, but we had to do that. About 800 billion of these are tied to what I call operational headaches, another 200 billion on monetization. We also run something called Tap It by Funware, which is a global mobile ad network like you would think of for uh, AdMob by Google or iAd or things like that. So we went after 
a massive thing, and we wanted to, it doesn't come through real good on the circles, but obviously enterprise software has changed radically. Uh, what we wanted to do is focus on how do you make something really compelling about the delivery of software, the pricing, the support, the maintenance, and everything that goes on. And the three disrupting forces, because we're talking about disruption here, have been the move to the cloud, uh, the move to mobile. And Funware was always mobile first and mobile native coding first because we found no shortcuts, no silver bullets, and no panaceas. So if anyone thinks HTML5 works for mobile, you are wrong, I will tell you. Uh, if you think responsive web design works, I will tell you you're wrong for mobile. Um, and if you think right once run anywhere platforms will ever work on mobile, I will tell you you're wrong as well. So that's three things that people can come out swinging here when we get to Q&A. Uh, but in all seriousness, we have supported the largest brands at transactional scale around the world. If you download the National Football League, we built it. If you download NASCAR, CBS, NBC, if you download Edmonds, and on and on and on, biggest brands at scale in 175 countries and 10 languages, we have seen what works and what doesn't. And our infrastructure work would be a lot easier if some of these things really did work across every single device and every single OS. Uh, but the harsh reality is they don't. Uh, not yet. Maybe HTML 6 or 7 or 8, something will. But when we built this, we actually pioneered something that didn't exist. You've talked about platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, software as a service. Uh, we pioneered mobile as a service, mass. And now mobile as a service is where the puck is at, and multi-screen as a service is where the puck is going. So we have built an entire infrastructure, not just to focus on smartphones and tablets, but television, wearable computing, in-car infotainment, digital signage, and IP television. Because at the end of the day, it's semantics about OS, memory processing power, and what kind of screen size and resolution do I get for what I'm messing around with. So what I wanted to do is to not educate you on big data, because you all are going to forget more about big data than I'm going to know. Uh, but what I would suggest to you is we're trying to do this from a location-specific perspective. Uh, we've partnered very closely, and we're working, and we just launched a joint venue solution that's going to go out with Cisco. And if you want to think of funware, think of like BASF. You know, we don't make the chips. We don't make the phones. We don't make the connected devices. We don't make the gear, the equipment. We don't even make the network. We make them all better. We make them more engaging. We make them easier to manage. And we make them more monetizable simultaneously. Think of us like a big jar of mobile Advil. And on client server content, you can handle everything that you need to be successful on mobile at scale for big brands at these high value touch points between their brand and what we call an anytime, anywhere audience. So the data is exploding, but we have a different problem with location. Um, the, the location problem we have is how do you define big data when you have one to three meter geofences at over 700,000 venues around the world with an X, a Y, and a Z coordinate so that you can capture everything happening in real time with one second updates? Right now, if you have an iPhone or an iPad, you'll find that you get 15 to 20 second updates and maybe about 10 meters of accuracy. All the things that are going to come next year, we work with Qualcomm on the Snapdragon chipsets with their core technologies. And what you're going to find is they're going to be able to do one second updates with one to three meter. This isn't just um, indoor location technology specific to like a mobility services engine from a Cisco. This is things that get into areas like uh, low energy Bluetooth and GPS and all of the above because what everyone did with mapping outdoors now has to happen indoors. And so what we've done is to try to partner with the chipset providers, the device providers, the equipment providers, and the networks, so that if you walk into any facility and you penetrate that geofence, we can reach out and give you a custom branded mobile experience that's really compelling on the fly without any coding. And that gets to be very complicated. So what we've been trying to do and focus on this, and what we've been trying to work extensively on, is to say, what do you even capture in a one to three meter radius? You know, what are the inputs and outputs, it's easy when we're all in here and we're stationary, but if you're at a mall, you're at a hospital, you're at a stadium, think of the velocity of the people going through. So if you take, call it 10,000 mobility service engines in the install base around the world for a place like Cisco, and these are things that manage up to 500 access points at once. So these aren't small facilities like a Burger King or a McDonald's, this is like this university. It's a casino, a theme park. 
Um, if you're managing up to 500 of those and you start doing quick math, you figure for every 20,000 people that randomly walks through, that's 100 million off of each 5,000 venues. And then you figure how many people throughout the year are going through there. And then how do you capture that? Because first we had a tracking that was done by things like uh, originally, you know, things like MAC address was okay before Apple would try to ban it. Before MAC addresses, um, we even had UDIDs. Now we're trying to go to IDFA, which is the ID for advertising, which is supposed to anonymize all of us, but it doesn't. So much like the NSA, don't be surprised. Uh, we know who you are, where you're at, what you like, what you don't, what you share, what you don't. And we integrate with places like Blue Kai and point of sale data. And then every time your device registers on the wireless network, we pull the MAC address, shoot it to our mobile cloud, create a nice big database so that we can triangulate who you are and know everything about you, even though we're not supposed to know any of that, right? Because when Apple did iOS 7, they banned the use of things like MAC address. But that actually comes off the chipset in the device. So you still get it because you have to register. So it's going to be very fascinating to think about what are the rules, how do we do it? Um, someone help me with the time just so I know. because. Two minutes, great. Um, what I want to do is basically suggest to you that as these solutions roll out, location is going to be the most important thing. When you say there was a question uh, from a gentleman that said, how is big data relevant? How do you make money? So there's an expense side. I get that. We focus immensely on monetization. When there's $60 billion of advertising that's getting targeted in real time with real time bidding to reach a specific demographic anywhere in the world right this second. And if you want 18 to 34 year old Latin moms in the United States and you're willing to bid the most, you get that audience. Well, I can tell you which row of Wembley Stadium do you want to target a specific group to give them an offer right as we speak because they're watching Manchester United play Chelsea in a football game. That's pretty outrageous. If I know to a three meter accuracy that you're looking at a specific exhibit of dinosaurs in Fernbank Museum in Atlanta, that's pretty compelling. So what you're going to start seeing is a level of hyper-targeting for the monetization for the people that want to spend the money to reach the people that are where they're at, that they want right now, doing what the behavior with the context awareness of what's happening. And this is going to be an explosion of interesting information for business intelligence and data capture. But I agree, it's all about the insight. So what I'll do to close is just suggest to you that what you're going to see is the world will be defined by a geofence. And this world is going to be defined by a geofence that will trigger anything we want it to within our infrastructure. It will trigger things like loyalty and rewards, location-based services, wayfinding, directions, points of interest, social media streams for the dialogue going on at the venue. It's going to trigger sponsorship and advertisement. It's going to trigger the content you want when you want it right now. And you're going to overlay that with digital and physical offers in real time because there's no one down at the bar and they want to offer us two for one drinks right now. So all of these things are going to be possible because you need to take all the work that you guys are doing amazing uh, jobs at. And we need to take all that behavior and data analysis and compact it into actionable intelligence for brands to reach the audience of choice wherever they may be. And this is what I think you're going to see an explosion in the monetization. And I would agree on healthcare. Uh, final comment, and I will shut up, is that we're launching something with the U Health System down in South Florida on their hospital venues. And when they said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, just trust us. We're going to take what we learned at theme parks at Disneyland, overlay it with the National Football League at what we learned at stadiums, combine it with the Grove as a big retail mall in Los Angeles, overlay it with second screen companion functionality like you're watching CBS or NBC, and we're going to do it for HIPAA compliant healthcare on site at your spot. As you can imagine, that's, that's a pretty overarching task. But what you're going to see is this is going to radically alter patient health care from the perspective of you. I have four kids. They break their leg. I can go in, and I have the entire workflow, the policy enforcement. The geofence triggers the communication, including the staff. And this is going to fundamentally alter everything about what we do. Uh, my name is Alan Natowski. Thank you very much for your time. And any questions, or I need to? Yeah, let's take a couple of questions. Yes, sir. In my position, I'm going to charge you for using it. How does that work into your model? You just can't get my position unless I give you permission to get it. There's a big movement now, especially after the NSA announcements and things. That's my position and my data. And if you want to use it to make money, I'm going to charge you to make money. How are you going to get around that? How does that work into a model? Well, 
Well, so first of all, when we work with the Fortune 5000, we never take things from people uh, that they don't volunteer on the application layer. So I'll be the first to say that if you go through and, you know, 95% plus of the world, when it says, will you allow push notices? Okay. And then can I use your location? Okay. They just are trying to get to the application. So with the consent, then you do that. Now, the other thing I'll say is there's sort of truth to what you're saying about um, the network, and there's somewhat not truth. If you come here and you jump on to the Wi-Fi network here, uh, each venue will make the decision as to whether you have to comply with something like a Facebook check-in to get free Wi-Fi service, or you can pay for it. Just like you may say, look, you can consume this content for free if you don't mind the ads and the other monetization, or are you giving me something for it. Otherwise, you might have the right to pay for that and not have that happen. So that is much more about the policy and the workflow enforcement because at a device level, it's just like when you buy at Target or other places. Once you have your name in a file in the credit reporting bureaus, all that information is getting traded. Every time you're in a loyalty program, it's getting shot up. And the idea that they don't know you're there buying, um, I think they try to keep it anonymous. Um, but if you provide consent, they can then get much more targeted. So I think there's going to be choices in all of these where the user's in charge, but 90% of all applications in the world are free. They're not free. Someone's either paying for it for you, you're going to pay for it, or somebody is going to say, I'll be a sponsor, an advertiser, or you do a behavior and I'll give you what you want. But I don't think people are going to do it without consent, but I think you've probably provided consent much more than you may realize uh, in things you've already done. We'll have to start a movement to take back your position. Uh, let's thank Alan again. Thank you. My uh, great honor our afternoon keynote speaker. Per Enge is one of the leading lights in uh, the academic community in what we call PNT, or Position Navigation and Timing, or GNSS, or Radio Navigation, more generally. Um, in fact, probably one of the other leading lights is also in the room. Mark Psyche, my former advisor from Cornell, is over here. Uh, the East Coast heavyweight, the West Coast heavyweight. So we're really... Uh, privileged to, to, to have them both here today. Per um, literally wrote the books that we use in GNSS. He was the associate editor of the original Blue Book series that we all considered the Bible in our field. And then more recently, he and uh, <coughs> Pratap Misra collaborated in writing the textbook that my students, some of uh, whom are here, and I use in the undergraduate courses and some in the, in the graduate courses. He's uh, enormously influential and he's fun to listen to. I think you'll enjoy what he has to say. Thanks, Pear, for coming. Thank you very much, Todd. And uh, thank you all for coming out this afternoon in this beautiful town. Uh, I haven't been here for many years, but it's uh, great to be back. And it has the same sharp feeling that it had some 15 years ago. Um, talk a little bit today about radio navigation. Of course, I'll start with GPS. And uh, we have two things afoot. One is we would like to make GPS more secure. Increasingly, position and GPS is being used for safety, certainly, financial transactions, access of all sorts. And the prospect of counterfeiting GPS or spoofing GPS is a real one. And uh, we want to talk about both how to counter that to protect our own house. And then we want to make the much more aggressive statement that once our house is strong, we will help information systems in general secure their information. So we'll begin by playing defense. But defense is always the prelude to the counterattack. And that's exactly what we're planning here. So. Um, here's a little bit more of a detail, a little bit on GPS. I'll break it into a historical frame, and we'll talk about so-called feared events. If you're a safety analyst, your life is essentially a list. It's a list of things that you worry about, and those are the feared events. They're articulated that way. There's a whole uh, protocol for handling them and thinking about them and analyzing them. And before 2010, we had so-called rare normals, by which we really meant space weather. I'll talk about that a little bit. And then just flat out faults. The data coming down from the GPS satellites was wrong. The clocks were running off in a way not 
anticipated by the data that was there. Something went wrong with the satellite itself. I'll show you a couple of examples. It is an awful lot of fun. It's a deep detective work, and, and you can lose yourself in these problems forever. Um, after, oh, okay, the good news is that starting in 2003, we started to operate some, a system that augments GPS called the Wide Area Augmentation System in North America, and it has uh, perfectly mitigated all those feared events that we were aware of up until that time. So a little bit on that as well, just to give you a feeling for what the FAA does, what the aviation community does about feared events. After two, 2010, the landscape changed. And really, uh, the community owes a lot to Todd Humphrey for bringing these things to light. And these were feared events of a different class, jammers. I guess we didn't need Todd's help with jammers. We already had that trouble. But uh, spoofers were something that he was very clear on and very helpful on. And so the response to that is ongoing. So I show a couple of arrows there and a couple of solutions there. Please understand those are simply my favorites. And they're, they're, whether we implement it that way or not, I don't know. And then we'll finally get around to this business about being the fourth security factor, authentication from space is what I like to call it. Um, I would like to claim that all this work I'm about to show you, I did by myself. <laughs> but I would be lying and lying so badly uh, that I couldn't do with myself. In fact, here are the people, uh, and, and the community is bigger than this. The community is bigger than this. Uh, it really is. But these are, <laughs> just happen to be the ones that I talk to on a weekly basis, let's say, uh, about these things. And um, I want to stress that the Stanford work has been supported by the FAA for the last 21 or 22 years, something like that. So that, our relationship with them is very deep. Uh, even so, this briefing is the maniacal raving of one professor, and it's not a government position. So uh, be, aware, be aware of that, and certainly the mistakes are mine. Outline, let's get into GPS today. Uh, here it is. Uh, just about everything you need to know about GPS is in this picture. Uh, there's one of the satellites up there. It carries a very good clock. And uh, clock technology was one of the real enablers for, for GPS, and it gets, comes down and gets measured by a very poor clock. But it's okay, there's only one bad clock in the whole system, so we can solve for it, and we do. And so we need those four things to go well on a per satellite basis for the GPS to work. We need, need the time of transmission to be on time. We need the data coming down from the satellite to be truly reflect and tell us where the satellite is, so we know where that reference point is. We need the speed of the wave to be reasonably close to what we think it should be going through an ionospheric plasma, but mostly free space. And then we need to make the time of arrival measurement well. Each of these four works just about all the time. And when they do, you get this kind of performance that's plus or minus five meters, plus or minus five meters, and you're in that circle. That's just some uh, GPS data in there. However, each of those four has a special, worthy, and deep pathology associated with it. Each of those four may sometimes fail in some very odd ways sometimes and give you an error scatter that looks very different than this. In fact, it might look like this, where there's that five meter circle replicated up there, and we have a scar out here uh, below and to the left. What happened here? This was on April 10th, 2007. A GPS satellite was rising above the Pacific Ocean, and uh, as we do, as a matter of routine, we were planning to do some station keeping. We were actually going to physically move the satellite. We do that about twice a year. So in accord with the prediction, predicted thrusts that we needed, we fired the thrusters. It was all good except for we had forgotten to set the satellite unhealthy. 
it's a, it's a human operation. So the satellite's moving around, and people are assuming the ephemeris is correct, but in fact it's not. And you can see that the error there is around 60 meters. For aviation, 60 meters is a very painful number. It means that if you think you're landing in the middle of the runway, you're in fact landing in the grass. So it's significant for us. So that was a pathology of two. Here, we'll talk about a pathology of three, the speed of the wave. Um, this augmentation system that I talk about builds for you in real time a map of the ionosphere above North America. And it populates those circles that you see there. And that data is provided to the user equipment. You interpolate between those circles and Bob's your uncle. It's all good unless there's severe space weather and you don't have this nice smooth Iono surface, but you have something like that. And so this kind of case study is the subject of I don't know how many of analyses to describe what kind of credit should we give to the quality, the accuracy of an individual GPS measurement once corrected in view of the possibility that there might be a pimple like that floating around somewhere in between our observation points. It's a big study. Let's go to something a little bit more uh, exotic. What you see there in both traces, on the left, on the top, is the civilian code. And you're looking very closely at one zero crossing of that civilian code. On the bottom, you see the PY code. That's the military code. It goes 10 times quicker. By the way, it's secure. We'll come back to that. But the edges are supposed to be synchronized. They're both driven by the same underlying clock. And you can see that I've drawn with as much care as I can muster with PowerPoint in my hand, a red line there and there. And you can see the offset right in there. That's 33 nanoseconds, 33 feet, that's 10 meters. Very, very uh, uh, really in the scheme of things, very neat fault. What it means is that the CA code chips, which are supposed to look like rectangles, were a little bit too long. They were supposed to be like this, exactly one microsecond, and they were one microsecond plus 33 nanoseconds. So the receiver is building a replica of the signal it expects, and it correlates the two, the replica with the received. The replica, of course, had the perfect nice chips, but it was rattling around inside that too fat chip that was coming from the satellite. And so that introduced a so-called dead zone into the control loop, and uh, the receiver didn't really know the arrival time, plus or minus uh, 33 nanoseconds divided by two. Well, that turns out uh, that it introduced a ranging error around five meters with geometry that led to a vertical positioning error of nine meters. We didn't notice this until we were using differential GPS to land airplanes at the Oshkosh Air Show in 1993 and the pilot, who was so astute and so used to flying GPS approaches, said, we keep on coming in high in the afternoon. So we went back and looked what satellites were in view in the afternoon. SP-19 was in view, and we were able to put the finger on, on that. We uh, went ahead and uh, commanded the SP-19 to switch its hardware from the A side to the B side. The B side didn't have the fault, and SP-19 went on to have a very long and productive life. So uh, it, it was all good. Here's WASP, basic idea. Just monitor all over North America. I don't think this qualifies as big data based on the definitions I heard earlier. But in our mind, it's big data because it comes at one hertz and we have to make life or death decisions at the one hertz rate. 
So if you add criticality to the data size, maybe you'd allow me to join that club. I don't know. <laughs> and we uplink our decisions to geostationary satellites. After all, the data is only valid over North America, so no need to fire up any MEOs or LEOs or anything like that. We just want to beam it back down. And we beam it back down on a signal that's identical to GPS in appearance. So it comes in the same antenna, the same front end, and basically the same uh, correlator structure uh, is, is all identical. The data, of course, is different on the, the WAS signal than GPS. But that's WAS. Um, today, it's used on about 80,000 aircraft and there are about 3,000 airports in the United States that you can fly into using vertical guidance from WAS. In the last five years, we have implemented more WAS approaches than we have in the entire history of the instrument landing system that went before it. And that's because we don't have to go out to the airport and install four transmitters with beams, uh, distance, range, measurement equipment, et cetera. All we have to do is go out to the airport and survey the touchdown box and make sure that the approach path does not transect any obstacles on the way to that touchdown box. Here's WAS against that April 7th data. The red scatter plot on the left is the same one you saw earlier. The augmented one over here shows you the green uh, scatter that WAS gave. And most importantly, there are no green data points out here in the red. In other words, we picked it up, we mitigated it, we threw it out of the solution, we did whatever we needed to do. It's uh, difficult <clears throat> to go to the Congress and explain to them that the purpose of WAS is really not to make the nominal scatter smaller. It does. It improves the accuracy from five meters to two meters. It's a good thing. And it's heavily used by agriculture and survey for that quality. But the real purpose is just to get rid of the red events. We're here uh, to cope with the tails of the distribution. Okay, beard events after 2010. So things changed on us at Liberty Airport in New Jersey. Have any of you flown in and out of Liberty? Yeah, it's a pretty big, pretty big place. <clears throat> we were putting in a, another GPS augmentation system, and it was going onto that lawn right behind the parking lot right there. And so there were a row of four GPS reference receivers about 100 yards apart arranged in a straight line. And we thought it was all good. We were ready to go. As a matter of fact, we were trying to enable kind of a jug handle approach into one of the crossing runways there, runway 28, that's typically uh, not uh, used at all in bad weather. And we were trying to make that happen. But FAA. So we put the system there and try and bake it for, let's say, a year just to make sure everything's good. And several times a week, we would lose the GPS reception. It was really annoying. This wasn't in our plan at all. Uh, and you know, we would only lose it for 10 seconds or 20 seconds, but uh, uh, aviation builds are so conservative that once we lose it, we have to re-examine it for 24 hours before we'll allow it back in. So we'd have a glitch, drop it, and we'd have to wait to see the ephemeris one more time uh, without acting on it to make sure that the ephemeris after that was consistent, and only then we would allow it back into the solution. So we took this 10-second problem and turned it into a one-day problem. The question before the house was, why were we dropping the measurements at all? Yes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I accept 95% of your explanation. Um, uh, there could have been uh, more financial motivations. Uh, what you typically hear is that a trucker, uh, of course, doesn't own the truck. And so when he's outbound, he's carrying a load that his boss knows about, that the owner of the truck knows about, and he's only being paid per hour. But he comes back deadheaded. He comes back empty. So when he's out there, he gets on the internet, and you can do a reverse auction and pick up a load and bring it back somewhere close to where you're going back to, and boss does not like that. that. As a matter of fact, if you're going to a strip club, that may be seen as a preferred activity. <laughs> you're, you're actually using the truck to make money, and, and, uh, and the, the boss, of course, wants some of that money. And so he puts a GPS tracker on the truck. The truck driver responds to that by putting a GPS jammer on the truck. You might think that those are difficult to obtain, but in fact, you can buy them on the internet for $39. Notice this one, it's really designed to look like a cell phone. So there's no you know, doubt about uh, the, that the user knows that this is kind of a criminal activity. Um, my favorite story about this is um, uh, concerns a, a gentleman called uh, James Avila. James Avila is the number one FAA troubleshooter of jammers. If James comes for you, it's just a matter of time. He is going to find you. <laughs> he will come with his truck with the direction finders and computers, and uh, he'll be here soon. <clears throat> and um, he is so devoted to it that he carries with him a handheld GPS jammer detector. So the GPS receiver by now is about that size. The GPS jammer on the left is about that size. And the jammer detector is about this size. And usually it just shows you a green light. But if it shows you a red light, that's because there's a jammer nearby. And James went to church with his family. Um, and uh, to his dismay, in the middle of the sermon, the jammer detector went off. So he informed his family that they were going to have to stay for the second service <laughs> because he wanted to speak to the, the pastor. <clears throat> so his family, he doesn't report whether his family was happy about this or not, but they stay. And uh, after the second service, James rushes up to the front of the church and says, Pastor, there's a, there's a jammer in your church. You think you're being set up for a joke, don't you? <laughs> this is a true story. Stick with me. The pastor says, of course there is. I'll show it to you. And he goes out back and finds that what the pastor had installed was not really a GPS jammer. It was a cell phone jammer. He was so unhappy about cell phones going off during the sermon that uh, he decided to just jam them out. And he noticed that he got the GPS feature for free. <laughs> and he thought, <laughs> everyone should know where they are when they're in my sermon. So uh, they don't need GPS either. So he jammed them both. <laughs> I remember when I first briefed these personal jammers in my own lab, there was a lot of sympathy for the truck drivers. People in the United States of America value their privacy, thank you very much. I grew up in Massachusetts. North of me is New Hampshire. The license plates there say, live free or die. And, and they mean it. So uh, uh, it, it's a tough issue. It's a very tough issue. So what are we going to do, or what do we do? Well, no panic. Uh, the FAA, being the organization that it is, has not turned off a single nav aid. Well, they've turned off a few, but they haven't turned off many of the navigation aids that were there before GPS. And so today, you could still fly DME, VOR, and in some cases, 
automatic direction finding. There's a big activity now to take those ground assets and reconfigure them such that they can be used even in the future airspace where our demands on navigation are going to be significantly greater than they are today. So just to summarize, yeah, we're backed up today. What we have today is not going to be good enough as we try and more and more take advantage of the full GPS capability. So we're in the process of reconfiguring all the DMEs, all the GBTs. GBTs are ground-based transmitters that are there uh, for automatic dependent surveillance. In other words, letting the air traffic controllers know where you are, as opposed to letting the pilot know where the airplane is. And so this is a, a pretty good set of some 2,000 uh, transmitters on the ground. <clears throat> the moment you start to work these ground-based radio systems, you feel heartache about coverage. We love satellites for a reason. That signal comes down from the sky. You're, yeah, the, yeah, it can be shadowed by a building, but honestly, you have to be standing right next to the darn building. It works really, really well. You start talking terrestrial, then you have lots of blockages along the ground. Line of sight coverage is not always that great. And so the issue with using these so they can provide vertical guidance to the thousands of airports that we have in the US is not a small one. And we're working on that right now. Part of the solution will be frequency diversity. This is the band from 960 up to 1215. I'll give you some familiar markers. This is GPS L2. GPS L5 is way up at 1575. It's off this way. This is, so there's a civil GPS signal there. There's a civil GPS signal at L5. Uh, the ADSB frequencies are the 1090, the 1030, and the 978. All the blue bars are the distance measuring equipment, DME, that we use. And the <coughs> green bars are the uh, signaling frequencies for automatic dependent surveillance. Our plan is to use all of that. We are going to light up this whole band. There is no way we're going to stand down on jamming the airspace. That band belongs to aviation. By the way, Spectrum is also a use it or lose it sort of situation. So we like to show utility. And if uh, we, we can show both utility and might at the same time, that's what we're going to do. Temporal diversity, this business about coming down into a valley when both your DMEs may be blocked by a mountain. Uh, we plan to draft off of the efforts by DARPA to build a better, cheaper inertial, and we'll use that for a little coasting, lateral navigation to lower and lower altitudes. Spoofing. So what you see in the upper left there is a very crude spoofer where you just take a GPS antenna outdoors, receive GPS signals, run a cable, and then broadcast it over here. Anyone receiving the GPS signal from this broadcast will think that they're at the location of the antenna. It's a so-called repeat back spoofer. It has other names, too. Uh, repeat back spoofing has happened because uh, that kind of strategy is used for GPS test. If you have your aircraft in the hangar, you'll definitely put a GPS antenna on the roof of the hangar and rebroadcast in the hangar. And what has happened is that rebroadcast signal has leaked out on the airfield and persuaded the airplanes out there that they were on the top of the hangar. A bit of a shocker for the pilot, I'm sure, but uh, uh, it kind of presages something that could be dangerous anyway. This thing down here is more malevolent. That's just any of a GPS signal simulator for testing any number of scenarios in the lab. And if you can do that and put that together, then you can create a trajectory that you might want either the user to believe it's following or for the user to send someone else and assert that that's their location. So that's why we're worried about spoofing. Mitigation, there's lots of things that have been put into the literature. And once again, I just pick 
I guess my favorites. <clears throat> the left shows both the civilian code, the low rate thing here in the vertical, and the high rate code is the military code. And civilian user equipment does not have the onboard keys to generate the military code. It's an asymmetric, uh, sorry, symmetric cryptographic system. And if you want to generate it, someone has to give you the hardware or software to do it. But what we could do is take advantage of the unpredictability of that code and require the user who is about to assert their position to us in, in, in view of a financial transaction or some transaction of high value, insist that they sample that and send it along as well. That would be difficult for them to predict, and we could, at our authentication server, receive that signal and compare to make sure that they're sending the military code that's currently in force, currently being transmitted. That's a good idea. The great good of it is that it compels the attacker to attack in real time. It, now, it's no longer possible to sit in your lab, put together the military code from last week or even a minute ago, and attach it to your message and say, oh, there's, there's my GPS signature as well as my password. So it's good because it compels the attacker to work in real time. It's bad, or it's not quite all the way there, for two reasons. First of all, that PY code signal doesn't go indoors very well. So it doesn't have great building penetration. GPS uh, has about 10 dB of margin. Rule of thumb is 10 dB per wall or ceiling. So with GPS, you can get through one wall or one ceiling. Now, if you have a special wall, I'm not prepared to argue with you about it. <clears throat> so what we want to do instead, oh, OK, and if the user accepts your challenge and says, well, I am going to respond in real time, it's easy for them to do. They can put a reference receiver of their own anywhere that's in, in sight of the GPS satellites that the user is using. So that mean, might mean it only needs to be 200, 500 kilometers away, and it could still effectively generate that counterfeit. So what we prefer is this either idea on the right. And on the right, you see two bird cages. The outer one is MEO. Those are the GPS satellites. The inner one is a LEO constellation. In fact, it happens to be Iridium. But so that's not germane, but other than it's there. And the idea there is to do the same kind of thing, generate a code under control of the service provider and broadcast it from the Iridium satellites. That has two enormous benefits. The first is that the Iridium satellites are only 1,000 kilometers away, plus or minus. Contrast that to the 20,000 kilometers up to MEO. The signals are 30 dB hotter. So. GPS had 10 dB of margin. It could go through one roof or one ceiling, one roof or one wall, 40 dB of margin. We can penetrate into a lot of buildings. But the real advantage is more subtle, in fact, more powerful than that. It addresses this business of the attack radius. How proximate does the attacker have to be? And here we have, for an example, the iridium beams for two of their satellites. The orange is one satellite, the blue is the other satellite. Notice how complicated that beam structure is. Notice that the sub-beams overlap or not, and that if you're looking at two satellites, the granularity of that structure goes down to around 10 kilometers. So now the attacker would have to attack in real time and be within 10 kilometers of you. If you're willing to wait 50 seconds to do a second check, they'd have to be within one kilometer of you. So this is the idea behind space-based authentication. You all good with that? 
Uh, we could pause here. So here it is uh, cartooned out. Uh, here's the user. He wants to uh, either uh, access data on his own computer. He wants to access data in the network. He wants to assert a financial transaction. Uh, or he wants to know where the message that you just sent him, you claim to be my bank. I want to know which server that came from geographically. Thank you very much. And I will put together that request. And as part of that package, I'll take a look at the satellite data. And I'll send along a snippet. It goes back and goes into the server. And in the server, we know what snippets we just uploaded to the Iridium satellites. We'll do the comparison. And if it works out, we'll approve your request. One latency to open servers? I think it would be on the order of one second. And um, uh, this uh, architecture and the, uh, the, the work belongs to a company called Satellis. So if you're uh, interested in following up on that, let me know, or you can contact uh, Greg or Mike. I give their names uh, at the beginning of the briefing. Location-based authentication. So now, finally, we go on the offense. The wish, the claim, the hope is that where you are could become the fourth security factor. What you know, the password, that's exhausted itself. What you have, that's a good one. Stanford just went to two-step authentication. I can't get on the Stanford net without reading the code that they send me on my phone and then uh, put that back in. What you are, yeah, I can still turn on my own old PC with a thumb swipe. And uh, I, I guess uh, that's good. What I understand, it's good until it's not. And then it fails rather spectacularly. So uh, uh, the, the wish or the thought is, let's add where you are. If you can imagine setting up a bank account and, and telling the bank at the beginning, here are my locations, this is my home, this is my work, those are the only two places I want to look at it. If you want to look at it some other place, you're going to have to make a call. The application that's far forward in, in my mind is personal health records. This is a, a slide from uh, Peter Levin at Amita. And uh, Peter was uh, chief technology officer of the Veterans Affairs for four years. Uh, Veterans Affairs is a place that cares a lot about delivering the best service that they can to the veterans. And they have a captive hospital system. So they instructed their hospitals to begin to code, uh, electronify, make electronic the records. And so we can move away from this. And the thing that Peter knew, Peter made the observation, is that having the information distributed like this, inaccessible like this, belonging to various different providers was interesting, understandable, but unhealthy. People uh, want to migrate towards a personal health information exchange where all of that information is available to the patients. If that's true, and that, that means that the, your personal health records are kept in this cache, they'll have to be protected in a special way. And so I think the need for data security in this world is going up and up. And so hopefully location-based authentication will find a, a role in there. We are done. My tale is told. So as it turns out, you'll be able to ask Per all the questions you'd like during the panel session. He's going to be one of our panelists, so write down your questions, the one you're, you're burning to ask, and we'll address it to him just after Ramsey's talk. Thank you, Per. Thank you very much. Ramsey Farragher comes to us from the University of Cambridge, where he graduated with his PhD in 2007 in opportunistic radio navigation. I met him last February, and uh, five minutes after I met him, I thought, wow, this guy and I speak the same language. Uh, he's an entrepreneur at heart, but is learning 
also what it's like to be an academic and work for four years at BAE Systems. Five, but yeah. Four to five years where he was a lead scientist there and was the brains behind, behind their uh, navigation basis on, on, based on signals of opportunity. So he'll take you through a, a smorgasbord of different ideas that have been popping into his head and many of them have, um, have a current application, entrepreneurial application. Go ahead and take it away. Right Thank you, Todd. Um, so, yes, it uh, gives me great pleasure to be out here today um, telling you about something very close to my heart, um, my current research area, which is positioning smartphones indoors. Um, there's no real secret on my first slide as to why it's currently very close to my heart, and I'm going to share with you why it's worth a lot of cash here in 2013. Um, uh, Todd just kindly introduced me, but to give you a bit of my background, I, I worked after my PhD um, in the defense industry, building on my PhD. So the PhD was, um, what can I use in the environment around me to navigate without GPS? And there's lots of stuff, mobile phone signals, TV signals. Even if you've got the time, money, and space and reason to do it, you can um, navigate pole to pole just using the Earth's gravitational field, if you know how. Um, and I worked on SERBs, um, UAVs, and cut my teeth on this robot car, which is like an angry version of the Google robot car. Um, this is um, tracking using medium wave AM radio. Uh, so this is 100-year-old technology. This is the stuff no one listens to anymore in their car radio uh, when they're driving around. But if you know how, you can get GPS-like performance for something that's over 100 years old. Um, this is digital TV, which has conveniently stopped running. Oh, there we go. Um, so fast forward to today, and, and digital TV can also be used with GPS-like accuracy if you know how. So that's tracking just using... Well, I was going to say a lot of uh, English references, uh, X Factor and uh, Fox News and stuff, navigation via uh, stuff you normally watch on TV. And this is an important part. This is machine learning. This is the system learning the locations of mobile phone masts that it didn't know anything about at the start as it drives around. So these ellipses here are collapsing down, and it's learning where the mobile phone masts are. And machine learning is, is becoming a very big part of opportunistic navigation, and I'll talk about uh, that a lot more in the talk. If you're interested in NavSub, which this all became, there's plenty of stuff on the internet about it. Um, the publicity that I got last year on this kind of stuff uh, culminated in Top Gear declaring me to be the real life Q, which is like everything Top Gear does, an extreme over-exaggeration of the truth. <laughs> but there is an interesting little link here. The real Q in the latest Skyfall, uh, uh, the latest James Bond film Skyfall, he gives James Bond two things, a gun and a tiny little radio tracking device. And that's it, no exploding pen, no flying car, and sure enough, when the chips are down and James Bond is about to be shot in the face by the bad guy, his little radio transmitter saves his life and the cavalry arrive and they rescue him. So even James Bond, when the chips are down, just like the rest of us, gets out his sat-nav. Um, so on that note, um, I'm going to do the first bit of um, uh, uh, crowdsourcing of my talk, since it's a big data talk. little show of hands. Who thinks they're currently being tracked right now, this very second? Who thinks that they are being electronically tracked? OK, I'm going to rephrase the question so that anyone with their hands down might be about to get a surprise. The answer is exactly the same. Um, who currently has mobile phone reception? So I do. You probably all do. Depends how deeply your phone is tucked away. But if you have mobile phone reception, then your position is known by your cellular network provider to anywhere between maybe uh, half a mile and a dozen miles. Um, it's the only way that your mobile phone works. Um, my wife, if she calls me right now, a lot of um, transmitters in Cambridge won't all start firing off looking for my phone. It'll be the local transmitter here. And it's because my phone number is currently on record live with my network provider, with the cell ID of the mast I can hear, and that is here in Austin, Texas. This is um, a, a track of someone being tracked using their mobile phone data. What's interesting is how long these records are kept. In the UK, these records are kept for a year. So my network provider, if I do something naughty and the police want to find out if I committed a crime or something, they can go back right back to a year to try to find out if I was where they suspected I was and stuff like that. So smartphones and positioning, well, phones, mobile phones, cell phones and positioning have always gone very closely tied together. And uh, we're now at a stage where we really want to move all of the benefits that we have from GPS indoors. So GPS is is now in everything. It's, it controls the telecommunications. Stock market is based on it. 
the food in our supermarkets is cheaper today than it would be without GPS because GPS has enabled things like precision agriculture, which has lowered costs. But we spend 80% of our time indoors, and there's lots of reasons why we want to bring all of these benefits into the indoor environment. Lots of people are interested in it, and um, let's have a look at why. So the traditional way of trying to do indoor positioning on smartphones is by a technique called fingerprinting, which was pioneered really by Skyhook. Well, in terms of commercialization, it was driven by Skyhook uh, about, starting about 10 years ago. It's a very big data set, as you can see. And the idea here is that you drive around and you sniff cellular masts, their signal strength, and you sniff Wi-Fi access points, IDs, and their signal strength, and you log it against position. You build up a big database and you provide this information to people when they need to. So based on the exact sequence of uh, uh, Wi-Fi MAC addresses and signal strengths that my phone is listening to right now, I can be positioned inside this auditorium. If I go into a different part of the building, the signal strengths will change, my position can be updated accordingly. And um, Apple and Google used to buy this off Skyhook. Then they tried to go it alone, and of course, there's patent battles and suing now going on. But both Google and Apple have stressed a number of times how precious um, owning their own ability to locate smartphone users is. So why? Why is it worth a billion dollars? Well, a large part of that is in advertising. Um, uh, the, the ability to target an advert to somebody at the right time, in the right place, is worth a lot of money. You can encourage someone to go ahead and just buy that thing. If you know they're looking at it right now and you know from other sources that they regularly look at this thing, I, you've logged their location a few times, maybe they just need that little push, that little 5% off voucher, and they'll go and buy it. So there's lots and lots of, of reasons for, um, for driving indoor positioning based on advertising alone. Some of it has come from analytics. So there's a company in the UK called Path Intelligence, and um, they have been developing a system to track shoppers around stores. So the gist is that you typically spend somewhere between half an hour and an hour in stores, uh, in, a, say, a big department store. Only about 20% of people go and buy something. And those people, the stores know stuff about. They know what they bought. The 80% that just wander through the store, the bricks and mortar store, know nothing about them. They have no knowledge as to what they did. Online stores, however, know everything about everybody, whether they've paid for something or not. They know how long they looked at stuff, what they searched, where the mouse pointer hovered. Even now, it all links in with Facebook and Twitter. There's a direct correlation between people sharing and liking stuff on Facebook and then later them going and purchasing it. So the stuff you learn in the online world that can drive huge profits, people are now keen to bring it into bricks and mortar stores. Um, so what uh, Path Intelligence do is they stick um, receivers around the environment that sniff everybody's mobile phone data. So anytime you send a text message, uh, initiate a call, go on the internet, your phone uh, releases this packet of electromagnetic radiation that's unique. You can pick it up around the store simultaneously in different locations and work out where it was emitted from. You can then track the users. So from this, you've got really rich analytics. You start to generate heat maps um, of the stores. You understand footfall, where people go, the paths people typically take. You can see how long people, or how many people walk past certain advertising billboards against others, how much money, therefore, you should charge for those different advertising billboards, things like that. And um, this is starting to drive an understanding as to how much money you can make by tracking people as they go around stores, and then how much money you can generate by targeting them with information at the right time. And then, of course, there's going to be lots of applications, and this is where the young entrepreneurs in the audience um, will have the opportunity to really make their money. So uh, I've picked randomly here Google uh, uh, traffic, the fact that this stuff just comes naturally by so many people using Google for sat-navs. This data is all live. Um, this red line drawn here is being drawn because Google know right now that cars are moving very slowly on that stretch, cars using Google, uh, Google uh, Maps for sat -nav. So these kind of applications can come naturally too. Imagine um, deciding whether you're going to go shopping or not right now, whether you're going to bother to drive all the way to the supermarket. Imagine just zooming in on Google Maps, zooming in and in and in onto that supermarket, zooming in and in and in, and zooming in on the aisles in the supermarket and the checkouts and going red lines on all those checkouts. I'm going to go in a couple of hours. It's going to be, it's going to be possible. It's going to be a new application um, of indoor positioning. So why don't we have it yet? Well, the best way to get accurate indoor positioning today is to manually survey the environment. So go to all the locations, have a floor plan, poke your finger on the map, take the readings, and carry on. And it takes a long time, and it will not scale. 
The alternative is Skyhook's approach um, and the approach that Google takes sniffing all of our um, uh, data as we use uh, Google Maps and stuff, which is people are driving around the streets, you can sniff all the Wi-Fi, and you can try to then extrapolate into the building and get a little bit of an idea as to um, uh, what, you, what kind of um, Wi-Fi signal strengths and access point lists they might hear just inside the building. But you're not going to be able to extrapolate that to kind of one meter accuracy, which is obviously the holy grail. So this is a bit of a, a problem. But there's a solution. And um, it was a very clever move from Apple in uh, April this year when they bought a little company of three people that had existed for about two years at the time called Wi-Fi Slam. And they paid $20 million for this technology. And what it is is basically an auto-surveying scheme. It's a way of allowing someone to move very quickly and quite freely through an environment and generating similar sorts of performance and survey as if they'd been manually surveying it. It basically takes a scruffy, rubbish attempt at the survey, one that was just made automatically as the person wandered around, and tidying it up. And this is the sort of true path that was taken. And as humans, we can look at that and go, well, yeah, it's probably supposed to look like that, so just squish this a bit, squeeze that a bit. So computers who don't have the Mark I eyeball that's taken millions of years to evolve um, and understanding of things like floor plans and corridors, it's actually um, a more tricky problem. It's one of the problems that I worked on in the defense industry. I've worked on flavors of SLAM, and I also have a SLAM-based smartphone positioning system, which I can show you. Mine runs in real time on a phone, unlike Wi-Fi SLAM, but anyway. Um, <laughs> let me just stop it here. Oh, rubbish. <laughs> Let's try that again. Um, let me try and pause it. Okay. So let me explain what you're looking at. This is the floor plan of a building. It's a, this building where I work, about 100 meters by 100 meters, so about um, 300 feet by 300 feet. Uh, it's for your pleasure only. The system did not know about walls and, and stuff like that. What's happened is the users come in from outside. While they were outside, the phone was in their pocket and had GPS. They were walking, and so the accelerometers in the phone could register this motion that looked like walking. And it could confirm the, from the GPS that there was indeed motion. And it can work out the step length. It can also work out if there's any error on the compass heading that the phone has. So if I'm holding the phone, or if it's in my pocket, or if it's in a bag, then the kind of compass heading the phone thinks I'm walking on might not actually be my true heading. And the GPS feed allows us to work that out. So very quickly, we can kind of calibrate the system. We can work out a step length and any kind of compass error. You go into the building, you lose GPS, and you freewheel on the accelerometer shaking motion and changes to your gyro smooth compass. And that will push this little red line around the building. And one of my colleagues um, at Cambridge, a chap called Rob Hall, works on making the red line as good as possible by doing things like trying to detect the type of step, back step, forward step, whether it's a fake step, stuff like this. The problem with the red line is it will always get worse with time. Every single step is based on the quality of the position of the last one. And all steps are slightly long or short, there's noise on the compass. So you'll see the red one get worse and worse with time. The green one is being clever. When we came into the building, we walked down here, we knew quite well where we were. Um, the phone sniffs the Wi-Fi, and it sniffs the magnetometer measurements as well, your compass measurement. So when you walk past a fire hydrant or a, a drinks machine or a, a large object, a printer in the corridor, you get a characteristic spike. And the same as if you go down that corridor next time, you can go, oh, fire hydrant, coffee machine, uh, photocopier, and back in Ramsey's corridor. Um, you can recognize the environment. The phone can too. It makes its own version of a view of the corridor, but with the magnetometer and the Wi-Fi. So it has a unique pattern that represents this corridor. What that means is when it comes back around and starts to move down here again, it can observe and correct any drift that has accumulated. So it self-corrects. It learns. It gets better with use. And you'll see as it runs through, it does a very good job of giving a realistic view of what happened, i.e. walking through the corridors, as opposed to the red one, which inevitably gets worse and worse and worse with time. That's SLAM. And that's worth $20 million to Apple. And you can see why. It is an auto-correcting uh, indoor positioning system that once you tap into crowdsourcing all of your users, you have a very rich way of very rapidly solving the indoor positioning problem. Apple then did something else neat. They jumped on the Bluetooth low energy bandwagon and they released support for what they're calling iBeacons. Now, um, Bluetooth low energy is going to be in lots of stuff. It's a very, very mature technology. It's been 10 years in the making. It's sitting on um, powerhouses like Nokia and Cambridge Silicon Radio. 
Um, it's going to enable lots of uh, low power, simple communication schemes. It's designed for things like pedometers to talk to your phone. It's designed for you to be able to stick a little tag on your keys so that if you ever leave them behind, your phone will go, do you know you're more than 15 meters from your keys? Maybe you want to sort that out. Um, that's what it's designed for. But because of the boom in indoor positioning and the advertising stuff, it's being jerry-rigged for tailored advertising. And this is the stuff you'll read. Microlocation, a term that I don't think existed about a year ago. Uh, indoor GPS, uh, wireless point of sale. And then you'll see stuff like this. Two-year battery life, 300-foot range. Well, we can look at some facts and pick out what's truth there and what's hype. So I've already mentioned BLE is um, uh, not an Apple invention. It is an extension of Bluetooth, Bluetooth low energy. It operates in the radio, uh, the, the Wi-Fi band, so it has the same propagation characteristics as Wi-Fi. So in terms of indoor positioning, it has the same issues with punching through walls as Wi-Fi does. It has the same problems with penetrating human bodies as Wi-Fi does. So it's going to be similar in terms of its abilities to do indoor positioning as Wi-Fi. Um, it is not designed to send adverts around. It's about 16 characters that this thing can squirt each time. It's designed to just send a number like a temperature measurement or a step count. It's not designed to send adverts. So in actual fact, all it's going to do is send little funny coded messages to smartphone apps, and smartphone apps will then run adverts, a picture, a movie, whatever. There's obviously a trade-off between battery life, the range you're going to get from the radio, and how often you're going to squirt your information out. And two years and 300 feet do not go together. Um, you can dial these things up to high power, but depending on what size battery you're going to put in the thing and therefore how big it's going to be, uh, you're, you're looking at um, minutes and, and hours if you're talking about maximum power broadcasts on very small batteries. So I have 18 BLE devices, and I've been playing with them ready for this talk. So this is my corridor. It's about uh, 40 meters, about 120 feet long by about 45 feet wide. This is a Wi-Fi coverage pattern here. And this is a BLE coverage pattern when set to what's going to be about a two-year lifetime. So as you can see, the coverage pattern is much smaller. Now, in, important points about indoor positioning. It depends on what you're going to call indoor positioning. If you would like to know your location freely throughout an environment, go anywhere you like in the environment and get a position update, then BLEs are not going to automatically give you that. You're going to have to put them everywhere because you're going to need lots of good overlap between lots of these little guys. Wi-Fi already, because of how much of a part of our society it's become, there's already good coverage from Wi-Fi. It already has good, lots of good overlapping sources. I've fired up my phone before, and I think there's sort of like five or six uh, Wi-Fi's that you can see in this room alone. Where um, BLE makes a big difference is in proximity measurement. So when you get right up close to a transmitter, you see a sudden spike in power. That means it's a very easy way of saying, I'm very close to this object. And so it's, it's really useful for, is this person stood right in front of this uh, set of razor blades before I send them an advert and a voucher? And that is really what it's going to be useful for, just pushing those adverts. It's not going to be useful, really, for providing global um, positioning freely throughout a building unless you're going to stick these things everywhere. Just give you a quick idea of what fingerprinting looks like. Um, this is the true position of uh, a person, and this very funky looking thing is a probability distribution as to where they are according to the Wi-Fi fingerprint measurements. I won't run the BLE movie. It looks just like this one. You know, it's not 10 times better. It's not 10 times worse. It basically looks like this one. So whenever you get a little blue dot indoors, a nice little blue circle, um, what you're seeing is the kind of um, simple view of the kind of geek view, which is this one. So that's what's really going on when you're trying to do fingerprinting and work out where you might be based on radio measurements indoors. And I've got to now try to find my way back there. So some of the risks of iBeacons, um, they're designed to be mobile, and uh, they'll be all over the place. They'll be on people's shoes. They'll be in people's pockets in their wallets and their keys if they're using them to help them find lost stuff. They are going to be everywhere, and they're going to be mobile. So if you're going to survey an environment and try to generate fingerprints for indoor positioning, you wouldn't like to be able to identify the mobile and the static ones. Tough. You're not going to be able to. You'll be able to if you own the store and you know the ones that you've put down in the environment, but that's it. Someone might move the stuff around in your environment too. The point is, this is a thing that says you're currently stood in front of the bargain bin DVD section. Here, have, a, have a, an advert to do with our DVDs. Someone can then pick that thing up and move it to a new part of the store, and the iBeacon will move with them, and it will work perfectly well. But it would destroy, or at least weaken, 
a fingerprinting scheme that's using BLEs. So fingerprinting, I think, stick to Wi-Fi unless you own all the iBeacons in your environment or set it up very carefully. But they're going to be brilliant for targeting adverts and coupons. Spoofing and spamming. Okay. There's a real risk for iBeacon abuse. This is what an iBeacon message looks like. There's an identifier at the front, and then there's a little message, as I said, maybe 16 characters that you can squirt out. Right. The right way to use iBeacons is to have a coded message that your app looks for, looks at, and goes, right, I'm going to load this picture or this movie or do something with this little piece of information. What is a real concern is if people don't understand how to use this properly and put a tiny URL web link here. That is uh, going to be a disaster because your phones can be BLE beacons, your phones can sniff this stuff, and your phones can rebroadcast this stuff. So someone very malicious can very easily write an app which sniffs the iBeacons that are around, strips that, sticks their own tiny URL website in it, and pretends to be the legit store iBeacon. That could be very, very embarrassing depending on the malicious websites they're sending you to. So hopefully people will understand this before they start deploying iBeacons and making use of them. So BLE will definitely take off. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, if you're going to buy hundreds of these things, go and talk to Nokia or CSR because they're actually much cheaper than the ones that you're buying on the internet today with the really cool glossy websites and stuff. Um, I wouldn't use uh, mobile BLE. I wouldn't use BLE for fingerprinting. It's too mobile a technology, um, but it is it is definitely the right technology for poking someone an advert at the right time in the right place. And this, as always, security is being left till last. And um, I hope people uh, take note of that. Finally, I think the chap at the back will be very interested in this. Um, you can check out your own contributions to big data via Google. If you Google, <laughs> Google Maps Location History, or type all that in, then one of two things will happen. You'll either be bored and get nothing here, or you will get a calendar and a map. And you can click all the way back through your history and watch where you were when. It's revealing when Google is sniffing the Wi-Fi's and your GPS and your cellular stuff. Now, this is enabled because I was surprised when I came across this. At some point, in the last few years, I've gone into Google settings on my phone, I've gone into location settings, and I've ticked location history, and I've forgotten all about it. That is where I live. Maybe, oh, how much time have I got left? I won't do this live, maybe, maybe later. But play with this yourself, right? Not only is that where I live, you can zoom in on that, and there's a Wi-Fi fingerprint. You can put the satellite view on, and that is my house. No doubt about it. That is exactly on my house. This is where I work. And this is Queen's College where I teach. So this is very, very precious data. There's another one. Look. Oh, I'm currently in the States, right? So what's concerning to me about this, I think this is great that I can go into this and I can delete stuff, which is probably why Google have enabled this. What concerns me about this, I would love to get a text message every couple of weeks from Google saying, have you remembered you've left location history ticked? Do you want this? Because here's the concern, right? I walk away accidentally or for, because I'm dragged away in an emergency from a computer that I'm logged into, my Gmail's logged in, right? It's not that big of a disaster to me if someone reads my Gmail because I'm careful about what I use my Gmail for versus what I use my university mail address for. But with a couple of clicks, never mind harvesting my, e my emails and spending hours reading it trying to look for cool stuff, they can just go straight to this and go, that's where he lives, that's where he works, he's doing something else there. They can go to right now and see that I'm in the States. And they can zoom in on that and see my house. So uh, I was both amazed and terrified to some degree when I saw this. So um, uh, if anyone's from Google, please start texting people if this is turned on and remind them that this is turned on. OK, any questions? Okay. Thank you, Ryan. Okay. We'd I invite Per and Ramsey to take your place here in the, at the table for the panel session. Also, we've got Dennis Cox and Assad. You are in the back. And is Raghu here? Yes. <coughs> so we've got a dynamite panel session for you here.
broadly themed, what's disruptive uh, about location analytics? And I'll just introduce the panel by saying, uh, is Jeff still here? Anyway, if Jeff were here, we want to be able to, uh, to address his question, what's disruptive? Not, not incremental, but what's disruptive and what, um, what will be disruptive, what has been and what will be. Let me just give a brief introduction uh, to our three new panelists. Uh, Dennis Cox comes from I Ixia, is, is that how we pronounce yes, it? Yes, Ixia. But uh, his real claim to fame was, was, was Breaking Point, which he developed uh, or co-founded in 2005, is that right? And he'll be talking maybe a, a little bit about that. He focuses on the security aspects of data, and big data is, is part of that. So he's looking at endpoint security and, and, um, and warehousing security. Raghul Gandhi, Gandhi comes to us from the uh, IBM Watson Research Center, where he specializes in wireless sensor networks and privacy and data mining. And he's got an interest in location also. Graduated from uh, Middle <laughs> University of um, Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, in 2010, so very recently. And finally, Asad Safar is um, our resident venture capitalist here on the, uh, on the panel. He's the co-CIO at Private Privateer Capital here in Austin and has invested in wireless startups and is interested in the wireless space, uh, especially with location overtones. So I've asked um, Dennis and Raghu and um, Asad to give us a brief opening statement, after which uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and open this up for broad questioning from you all and, uh, and uh, among the panelists. So Dennis, if you'd like. Sure. Um, really what I want to talk about today is uh, I'll be a little bit negative because I'm a security guy. And I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about individual items. And at security, what we look for is the intersects because one guy really doesn't talk to the other guy that well. And there's always a problem at the intersect. One guy does something okay with the GPS. One guy doesn't go to the phone. Another guy doesn't go to the accelerometer. And there's a problem between all three. And that's where we exploit. And we do really well at that. And I hope to God somebody develops a service that's not based on advertising using all this mobile data. Because I'm going to tell you, everybody's made their money in advertising. There are three big houses, and they've made it. Really, uh, VJ said it earlier, it's really service chaining and networking where this applies to. This is really good stuff for that. Think about it. The mobile data is collected originally to figure out where to put towers to give you better service and give you better coverage. Those things apply. What you don't want to see it happening for is advanced services that tell you, for example, I have a Windows phone because I'm odd, and I have a Windows phone, and uh, you go to Bing, and it has local search. And I can go local search, and it tells me where a nearby restaurant is. That's great. But worse yet, it tells me the Yelp review. OK, so it tells me it's a good restaurant, a bad restaurant. Well, what's going to happen is it's going to tell you whether or not it's good or not on a Friday night. Then it's going to tell you what the waiter is and who's good. And someone mentioned maybe the wait time. But you're going to change the economics of things, because you won't go there on Friday nights if that waiter's there, and you won't go there if it's busy and that restaurant won't be able to sustain itself. You have to realize that stuff happens, and it happens over and over again, just as online shopping has done to bookstores, for example. And you also have to realize that there's privacy concerns with that, too, that no one's thinking about. In the past, all this data was stored, for better or worse, by the law enforcement. You have to get warrants, or at least you used to have to get warrants. You'd have to get warrants to that data, and uh, you'd have to prove out the reason why you'd want to do that and, and what you'd want to get to. Now you're giving it to capitalist pigs. You've given this data to Facebook, you've given this data to Google, and he's buying up five houses in Palo Alto. He really doesn't give a shit about you. What he cares about is his money, okay? And you're giving it to him free of charge for convenience. And that's very scary. You, you have to realize that, that, that every company now is a big data company because they can sell your information. And, and you don't want that to happen, but you'll never not, you won't do it. Guys like me won't because we're 40. But guys that are 22 just really want to get that picture on Instagram, and they want to geotag it themselves. So there's a lot of dangers there. And so think about it and work with people around you to come up with this answer, because it's scary. Facebook doesn't care about the law. It's just something that's in the way. Just remember that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK. So. All right. So maybe you know I'll add to the negative sentiment over there, <laughs> and, uh, and 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 basically you know pick up on saying that hey you know many people know where I am right now. I mean I can pull up the Texas Wireless Summit webpage, 
and uh, you know everybody in the world knows I'm sitting right here in in Austin in this particular room. Everybody knows that, and it's not just that. I mean, I can pick up on uh, you know several public profiles of me or anybody in this room for that matter. And somebody said, "How private are we?" But my location is known to I don't know. I mean, so many different people at so many different points of time. I think what is more interesting is really being able to say uh, that tracking a person in real time is, is, is more of an issue, I would say, rather than knowing where you are exactly at this point. I mean, I can say, I think there was this website called pleaserobme.com, which there was this famous, uh, you know, per, famous uh, story which goes about somebody from Hawaii, you know, vacationing in Hawaii, put a Facebook status saying, oh, I'm enjoying my time on, at Hawaii Beach or whatever, right? And then there were these set of thieves who came by to their, their home, stripped the entire home, you know, including the carpet in the home, happily walked out without any trouble at all, and all because of one Facebook status that the person is not at home. And, and this is the kind of you know, things that, that are very, uh, you know, it, it just makes me you know, wonder like, uh, what, what, what's happening, maybe what's happening in my home? Maybe I should have like a video camera sitting over here that talks to me of what is, you know, what is going on wrong with my home. But I, I don't think there's, there's any way, I, I make this is more like a very you know, disruptive statement that I want to make. I don't think there is any way that you can hide your location you know, it could be coming from your uh, cell phone provider, tracking your, you know, you using your cell phone. It could be coming from my own uh, details where, you know, I didn't give any permission to uh, Texas Wireless Summit to put up my information on the web page. Uh, so so do, do I have, I mean, basically, there is the, the, the utility versus privacy trade-off is very glaring in location as such. With that, uh, I think everything else you know people have covered. So maybe I let let this negative sentiment be around for a while. Cheer us up. I sure, sure. <laughs> so I want to make a couple of points here, and I want to take a more of a macro picture in the way. So we, we want to talk about where the industry is heading, but where were we when big data wasn't there? What what was done? It was sampling. We'll take sample of data, we'll do some sort of regression, and we'll figure out a relationship. What was the issue with it? Because the sample was biased, and we'll get a macro picture of it, not detail level picture, subcategories, intricacies. And big data solved that problem. You take all the data, and you get, can get detailed information, intricacies, delicate relationships, you can figure out. Big data help us figure out what the relationship is, but it still hasn't answered one major problem. Why is the relationship there? I can figure out if there's a consumer walking in, if I'm a retailer, and a consumer is walking in and is a regular customer, what's his behavior is. But what about bringing a next consumer here who's never been in my store? I'll give you a good stat. Groupon, its hit rate on its advertisement is less than 1%. Talk about target advertisement. Less than 1% hit rate on its target advertisements campaigns. So I think personally, one big ideology or one big opportunity is figuring out why is the relationship there. The second big thing that I want to focus on is I think there was a slide before on defining big data. So we had volume, we have a lot of data. We have to manage a lot of data and there's a lot of progress being made. New data warehouses has been built, et cetera, et cetera. Velocity, hey, CPU power cut down latencies, new architectures have been come up, a lot of new ideas, a lot of themes out there. <coughs> Variety, I want both structured data, unstructured data, et cetera. And the fourth major, fourth major theme is veracity, accuracy problem, and that's where Ramsey touched base on. I think, I think the next big opportunity is figuring out the accuracy of the data, figuring out the delicacies, delicacies intricacies of those relationships. It has huge impact in a number of industries, agriculture, retail. Just think about retail. It's in US, it's a $3.5 trillion industry. Every year there are in US $350 billion coupons. 99% of those are still paper. 1% is media. Look at the opportunity. But yet, 
with our current system, GPS, as is, is very, very difficult to figure out where exactly the consumer is up to an inches, where exactly my tractor is <coughs> up to an inches. I think there's a huge, huge opportunity in, in, in those industries. Great, thank you. Thank you. I'll uh, start the questioning off with uh, maybe a factual question. Uh, our smartphones are able to locate our position, and of course, the providers of those phones, whether it be uh, a Google platform or an Android platform or an Apple platform, they know where we are. But they've also got licensed uh, licensees, uh, customers to whom they sell these data. How pervasive is the practice of selling our data? How many of the applications running on our iPhones or our Android phones are data cognizant? And so how many other companies out there have our data? Or is it stovepiped in Facebook and Google and Apple? I can ask Ramsey this and maybe Dennis too. Oh, sure. Um, my answer to that would be everybody has your data. Let's go through AT&T. AT&T, we have our Apple phone or there's one guy with Windows phone, but they can figure me out anywhere. But I got, the, got my iPhone or I got my Android, so they know where I am. And then I'm going to go to the Enob. I'm going to go to the tower. So Ericsson knows where I am because Ericsson owns a tower and they're going to do diagnosis on it. Huawei knows where it is, which is a China, by the way. So they know where you are too. And then uh, it comes back over. Not to say that's a bad thing. Just now you've got, you know, we've got our data located in California. We've got our data located in Dallas. We've got it located in Stockholm, where Ericsson is. And we've got our data located in Shanghai, where Huawei is, right? It's all over the place. That's the Eno B. And then I go through my Eno B and I go to diameter. All right, so I go to my MME. And so I have my vendor there, and that's Juniper. Juniper's based in Santa Clara. They have it as well. It's great. And I keep going through my network, and every piece of my network goes through there. Then I go through a probe, like a tech probe. And the tech looks at my probe to look at voice quality. They have all that location data as well. So everybody along that path has their own access to that data. So there's no licensee involved there. They're just equipment manufacturers. Now let's add licensees on top of that. It gets pretty complicated pretty quick. In terms of the um, smartphone world, uh, depending on the platform, it can be a bit of a wild west. So um, Apple is very locked down. And um, uh, if you submit an app, an app to the Apple Store, it disappears into their echelons for a while. And it may be accepted or rejected. Interestingly, there's been evidence in the past that sometimes they reject stuff and then magically it becomes part of Apple stuff in the future. Um, please don't sue me. <laughs> Um, and uh, on the flip side, Google is an extremely open platform. So the stuff I showed you there, I can't code that up on Apple because I, I, on an Apple device, I cannot access the information I need to access to do that. So I, I develop on, on Google. Um, but the flip side is, uh, because it's such a flexible platform, it, it is straightforward to do malicious stuff. And um, it's down to the users, really, to carefully read the information that's presented to them the typical kind of boring stuff. So you, you've got this cool looking app that you want to play with, you press go, and you present it with all this information that says this app is going to read your phone contact book list. This app is able to use your course location. This app is able to use your find location. This app is able to access the internet. And you're supposed to look at this list and go, I just wanted to play solitaire. Um, and <laughs> that's probably, at that point, you go, oh, this is a bad solitaire app. But there's a lot of it is on the, the end user. There are, there are apps that you should definitely install, like Lookout and other apps that are acting as your, um, uh, your uh, virus checker, I suppose, in the smartphone world. But um, uh, we are racing along with technology. Security is always left to last. And um, uh, yes, um, it's, it's So for the security difficult. part, it's been overcome by events. I mean, you're all existence proofs up here you're all wringing your hands and using your iPhones, right? Or your, your smartphones. So <laughs> it's an existence proof of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of convenience trumping security. Assad, um, what about the promise of location-based services? Do you, do you really think they've delivered on the hype uh, over the last couple of years? Do you think there are going to be breakthroughs going forward that will ultimately deliver on the hype? Or will people simply become fed up with getting fed with, uh, with adverts? Yeah, so I think, I think one big idea was mobile advertisement, right? So if you look at the mobile advertisement market right now, between Google, Yahoo, and Apple, they have more than 50% of the market share right now. And then you've got Millennial Media and then JumpTap, which they just merged, they have almost 30% of the market share. So it's a very, very, very competitive market at this point. 
In fact, JumpTap and Millennium Media merged a couple months ago, and I know both the companies pretty well because it was just very, very, very competitive to exist there in the market. Wait, you're saying there are few players, yet it's competitive. Because Google, you're going after Google, you're going after Apple, so you're going after money. Yahoo, and they've got big muscles out there. By the way, if you look at Google or uh, Apple, they bought those companies back in 2009 and 2010. Apple bought Quattro in 2009. Google bought Ed, Ed Web, AdMob in 2010. So they did these acquisitions three, four years ago, and now they're big muscles. So you're gonna go after very, very, very strong big muscles, so you better be ready to compete. And it's very, very tough to compete in general mobile advertisement market. Now, if you take a step forward, there are areas like, for example, retail space, which I talked about. Uh, retail, if you are a retailer, you want to price discriminate. You want to price discriminate right at the shelf. You want to give a different price to the consumer depending upon his behavior, his features, et cetera, et cetera. That's where the opportunity is. It's a $3.5 trillion market. There are 350 billion coupons every year. But the opportunity, again, the, the issues there are, a lot of money in the last couple of years have gone even in that space. So you've got Euclid, Shopkick, just tons and tons of money have gone in, in this space. And, and the idea is, that the questions that people are asking, number one is, how accurate is the data? Is the GPS accurate? So I might be in the next store but I might be getting coupons coming from this store. How accurate is this? Secondly, the idea, I think privacy, slowly and steadily is becoming a big issue. Push versus pull technology. Google adverbs, hey, should I ask for coupons or should those be forced on me? So that's another idea. I think the opportunity where I see is the low energy Bluetooth technology where I can ask for it. So I can go to a shelf and I have five different brands there, and I can say, I'm looking for a detergent, and can the brands bid for me in real time? And then the real brands can bid on me, and I can select it. Low energy, Bluetooth technology, I think, I think there's a huge future there. Let me open it up to the, the audience for questions. Thank you, I didn't hear anybody um, really comment about the problem or the possibility of somebody disassociating you from your data. And an example with the extended chain can really create a mess. And then the, 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 the counterfactual to some of the things that were said, it maybe can be more optimistic, is that there is a possibility that someone might steal your all's identity and do more with it than you have. I mean, really, no, it more comes down to classification, if you think about it that way. So let's say that um, I, I'm a Texan, so I like to fish, and uh, I like to uh, drive cars, um, I drink beer, et cetera. And let's say I, I take this one route to work every day, and there's a dozen people that take that route, and they all are serial killers. <laughs> Am I a serial killer? Is that what the data showed? That's really what it gets down to, is if everybody is looking at that data, it all depends on that person's view on that data. Let's take a, a common one that happens all the time to celebrities, right? So uh, uh, you got a lady at the phone company, and she works there, and she figures out that she wants to find the phone number to Brad Pitt. She types in this phone number and goes, oh, this is really exciting. I've got Brad Pitt's number. Oh, I know his location. He's over here. I'm going to sell it to a paparazzi, right? Very standard. No big deal. But then let's say she gets curious about her boss. She types in the phone number of her boss and knows he went to the local head shop down the street, and she goes, ooh, and she tells everybody at work he's a drug addict. That's what big data causes. It's that privacy concern there. It's that, it's that, that thing. Now, of course, these are stretched truth examples, right? They're, they're far far between, but they do happen quite often. The paparazzi one is always happening here in America, right? That's a pretty common technique. And everybody's curious about their boss, and people are curious about their neighbors, and people do look them up. Um, Facebook, everybody goes back and they query people they just saw. I wonder what she's like or what he's like. Th that's where it comes to, and when people associate with another person or another person's behavior based on your behavior. To me, that's what is yeah. scary. Uh, the, the evidence shows, though, Dennis, that our, our mobility traces are quite unique. Uh, with four randomly chosen spatial temporal points, I can uniquely identify 95% of people. Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So you and those, those malefactors yeah. are not probably going to be confused too often. And but another thing I, I comment, I mean, you've, you've reminded us several times now, you know, keep, be aware of this. Uh, make sure it's on, on your mind, et cetera, et cetera. But, that's not a solution. No, it's right? not. Awareness, is, is it just that, that you uh, have a good feeling that you're 
the sophisticated type that knows that you're being tracked and still willingly acts, you know, uh, allows yourself to be tracked. Is there anything concrete we can do, say, from unplugging from our devices? Vote for different people, I guess. Uh, change the so laws. You, you, you're looking for a legal... Well, well for example, uh, if someone keeps that data for a year, um, that's understandable law enforcement wants that data, but is it fair to Facebook to have that data? I should opt in. There was one man mentioned up here, he says, well, I should be able to sell my location. Well, it's kind of tough to do, but you should be able to opt out of those locations, location history. Trust me, I'm gonna go right there and check out my browser and figure out where I've been, and then I'm gonna figure out where you all been. <laughs> no, uh, but, uh, no. so. Well, and, opting out <laughs> is uh, currently available in, in many of these platforms. It is. It's it, just you don't get to opt out and keep the convenience. I totally agree that's, with you. That's exactly it. I, I ditched a slide on exactly this. If you try to opt out of, of Wi-Fi and, and sell phone positioning in, in your Android phone, um, then you, you can't have it both ways. You either are able to access the service and you must tick OK on the disclaimer box that says I'm going to and honestly sniff your data all the time even when you're not running GPS all this kind of stuff if you decline it you go back out and the, the box is unticked so you cannot access the potentially life-saving technology of Wi-Fi and cellular pos positioning unless you opt in to sharing nope, anonymized data. Yeah. Raghu you, you mentioned the utility uh, uh, privacy trade-off and this is not just one that concerns big data or, or wireless, in fact, it's more pervasive than that. What, what, what do you know about that? What can you say more abstractly? Uh, well, I think I can probably comment on the location aspects of it uh, because that's, that's what I've primarily worked in. So I think one, one thing that I, at least I observe in location is that uh, there's a lot of portions of location. When I, when I speak of location, it is more like location traces of myself. There's a lot of portions of location traces that I don't really care about, and I'm happy that I, I share it with other people. And I, I presume that's that's common with a lot of people over here. I mean, the, let's say, for example, uh, you know, how do I uh, go from work to home? I mean, that's typically, I think, Many people can just guess by just look, we're, we're punching the numbers in Google Map, and they'll be able to find out. But it is the portions where I really care about could be uh, I don't want the world to know, you know, where uh, where I'm vacationing, for example. I, I want that I want that portion, that part, to be kept secret. So, and, and or maybe kept private to only certain set of people. So that's where you know, somehow being able to uh, say suppress the data in portions, especially for location traces, becomes very important. And now I, I really don't know what the solution for doing that is, because we have, we have explored different ways of suppressing that, uh, that, that portions of the location, but nothing really works. And there are these techniques called spatial cloaking, where you can just specify regions, say, I don't want to be tracked in this region. And I think Google has this one notion of cutting off portions of your traces towards the end, but that doesn't really buy you anything. We don't, we don't anonymize now. Uh, and and it, it's, not only, it's not only under your control. I mean, I, I can give you an example where, in, let's say, taxis are now, they track locations uh, continuously. So if I sit in a taxi and if I know, uh, if, if somebody else knows that, you know, hey, this guy lives far away in some, he's like some millionaire, not that I am, but you know, he's living far away, but he takes his taxi, and then somehow he gets, somebody gets access to the taxi cab data, and they're able to figure out that you live, and this guy took the taxi on so-and-so day, and this is a com common thing that keeps happening. So how do I control that? So th that, that is why I started off with a very negative sentiment of saying, well, how do I really control access to location data across this varied set of sources of data which is not which may not be in my control it's not just my cell phone that is tracking me it is so many other pieces of location data that track me it's like cars for example track me on star devices and so on which seems to speak against the idea of cloaking i mean maybe exactly. you can cloak with one uh, with, with one company but uh, 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 pan company cloaking sounds to me like a john lennon's imagine song mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, 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 I, he's got the microphone now. I'll, I'll pass it to you right oh, now. Oh, sure. Hello? Is this on? Yeah, should be, but I can see a red light. I see a red light. I can, I can speak up. Aren't we being a little bit sort of naive at some level? I mean, the reality is this is just another incantation of our security being gone for a long time. I mean, it's called the white pages. I mean, you know, you can go from the white page. Wow. 
white pages through look at the nature of the internet, browsing, cookies, caching. I mean, come on. Sniffers, we've been doing this 30 years. I mean, we're talking about there's nothing really new here except for maybe the instantaneous mobility, which gets back to the interesting conversation here about making big data real time and real time decisions and closing the window. So one of the things, I mean, I would just comment, the thing we need most of all is something that would actually simplify for the user the policies around eliminating, like for example, your cache in your browser, simplifying security in your home, for example, making it easy. It's all about the, the simplification for, and putting those tools in, in you know, the hands of the user so that we can push a button and delete our cache automatically from Google Maps. I mean, think, simplifying and policy-based, I mean, it's, it's kind of the same old story, right? My question is around, I mean, we did some work back years ago for the NSA doing large-scale high-order multi-dimensional analysis where we did like 36 dimensions of synthetic parameters for, for cognitive network intrusion detection, for example, right? And this has been around for years. But I'm curious, now that we have more computational capacity and we have more sources of data, maybe even, I know you, you've done some work in, in, in security from a perimeter protection, have we made any progress in that area from big data meets network data meets consumer data? Because the, the bad guys are, all, are really anomaly. Right? There's only a few folks out there that are doing it, right? And we just need to be able to detect an alert in that instance. But it needs to be a day zero at alert versus a day one at alert with signatures. So long-winded question. <laughs> yeah. Where are we? Yeah, I think it has quite a bit. It, it definitely has in terms of uh, someone mentioned where you are at location, badge access, door access, where you were. A lot of companies have the ability to delete your mail off your cell phone when you lose it. And they can track that in real time. So you're separated from your phone. You can now delete that. It's pretty cool. It's a big improvement on security and, and your, your rights. Um, there's also a big improvement, especially when you mentioned the day zero in terms of tracking people down that to commit those acts, right? So it makes prosecution a little bit easier as you can trace things through the network. And now that we have this big data and people are sampling the data, you can find the guy in Tanzania or Uzbekistan or Estonia or the Bronx that did it. So I think the classic example is the Boston bombing. Uh, suspects were caught because of mobility, mobility traces. Um, the other thing is that uh, technology is just snowballing. So, like, Facebook began as quite a simple way to ping people inside just one university. Gmail started in whatever it was, 2004, as a way to, as a way to just send a message to somebody you know and love. Today, it tracks your every movement. And it, I mean, I, <laughs> specialist on this, I didn't know about that till somebody, an astrophysicist, came up to me a few days ago because I gave a talk on local radio station about this kind of stuff and was like, ah, oh, after your talk, I was having to play it. And that made my jaw drop. And God knows how long ago, I flicked a, a tick box on my phone and enabled that, and I'd forgot. And if anyone should know about that, it's me. And the point is that everything is snowballing and so much is being protected by one password. And passwords aren't secure. People reuse passwords. I do not yet have a phone with a fingerprint scan. So I have loads of stuff logged in automatic on my phone. I don't keep typing in my Facebook password, my Gmail password, my Twitter password. So I have one little pattern swipe that unlocks all of those things. And the whole point of, of, of 12 digit alphanumeric passwords has gone out the window. Someone shoulder surfs me, bops you on the back of my head, takes my phone off me, and they've got my Facebook, my Gmail, my Twitter till I wake up. So it's more to do with how it's all snowballed than, than what each individual little piece means. And we race through institutions. So the BLE security stuff, like I, I genuinely fear how many people might start naively implementing BLEs with tiny URL web links and expose themselves to potentially hugely embarrassing spam stuff that could, could close a, a small store. So it's more about snowballing than, than individual moments of what's going on. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that, Dennis. And uh, from some of the previous comments, my reaction is the Borg has arrived. I mean, uh, any <laughs> resistance is futile, <laughs> which scares a lot out of me. But so I, I, I will invite comments on from a different angle. I mean, in today's presentations and in many other presentations, it seems that there is an implicit assumption that uh, advertising is the way to go. We will continue that way. And that there will be no modification. The situation is like that, and we accept as it goes. And I wonder whether, I mean, I, for one, have a negative reaction when I am overly targeted. 
even today, in simple things like Google. I mean, occasionally I accept. I mean, if I go and buy something that I like and they send a little hint, it's okay. But if I feel that I am overly targeted, my reaction is absolutely negative. And I invite uh, something about that. Maybe it's a generational thing. I mean, maybe people my, of my generation will react that way. Uh, or will be a backlash in which people, I mean, I'm going back to the location piece, right? I mean, yes, you target me bec and because you know exactly where I am. The head out, I get the head out of here, okay? Questions, I mean, that's a question for the panel. Maybe how can we be more nuanced in our targeting because the targeting isn't going to stop. That's driving a lot of this. Uh, how can we be more stylish in how we target? You have an answer for that? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's on. Well, I think, I'm not saying, okay, I won't say it's generational, but a lot of people who they are growing up in digital world and digital age, they don't really care. We have taught them to not care. We are guilty of it. Technologists, scientists, it's juvenile for us too, it's a juvenile world. But also I will say, they will get there. They will know how happy you are to see the color of the what you're wearing. And they will not hit you with 20 advertisement. They will hit you with one that you really like and you will buy. And it's coming. And when we talk about the big data, emotional data is factored out. And the reason for it, as he said, Gmail didn't start it to pick our emotion, neither Facebook, neither of those platforms. They, start, they start for something else, totally unrelated. Facebook was a dating platform. So when you look at your question, they will get there. It's coming. It's going to be faster than you think. The fingerprints you put in, yeah, it's going to come. I had the question besides answering you, sorry, interrupting all of you guys, <laughs> is about Ramsey and I talked earlier. And it, has, it touches the earlier panel, if it's okay with you, and some of later this one. It was about the Facebook. Uh, we know millions of people there on the Facebook are very young people. They went in and signed up. They lied to Facebook. Facebook knew they lied. They accept them. We know Google has 37 ways to know who you are. They say we want to verify you're not a thief, but, well, that's another question to be answered. Facebook also has a way to know who you are. You use AT&T. They are in touch with AT&T data. You use Microsoft. They know about Microsoft data. And... So a couple days ago, or last week, I have a jet like a still, I think it was last week, that Facebook changed the policy on the age. They said, go ahead. And the reason for that, I, I want you guys to help me out. I'm just questioning this. Possibly is a corrupted data, a big data on a structure that came to them. millions of young kids. They sign up, and now they have to clean it up because it's important to them to know how old those kids are. In a way they know, because they know they say this is my dad, my family, your cousins. They have a way to figure out, hey, you might be 15, even though you said you're 19, because you hang out with lots of 15 years old kids. So my question is, how are they going to do it? I mean, is there is a way ever they would be, accuracy of that data will get in a place, or it'd be always 20% of data in Facebook, not a Google, Facebook specifically, that is really not presenting the age of the people they are in. And uh, has to do with the policy change in California. They said you have to erase the data for the people that are under age 20. So is it, I'm interested to know about that part, if you guys have a knowledge on it. Appreciate it. I believe the question is, do we think that we can use big data to infer if people are lying and infer things about their, their ages? Well, um, there's a really interesting TED talk. I wish I could remember the name of the guy. Um, uh, a study that showed that um, things like uh, TripAdvisor uh, is plagued with these problems where people um, just put fake reviews on the people who own the hotels go and pretend to be people. And brilliant piece of very simple machine learning, uh, a, a technique called um, Naive Bayesian Classifier. It's actually got a, it's much simpler than its cool name sounds. And um, uh, you can apply this very simple trick and uh, you look for particular single words, words together and triple words. And the General gist is that when somebody is lying, they're trying to convince themselves as much as the other person. So someone says I a lot more when they're lying 
it's as, as if they're trying to uh, put themselves in the same position. So if I give a real review of AT&T Conference Center, I will describe facts. Food really good, uh, room really big, loved it, close to where I was going. Um, someone who's lying might typically go, I found the food to be excellent, and I really like the fact that the rooms are so big. And, and there's these ways of, of looking at little slips people give away to detect when they've written text that's full of lies or not. So there are certainly ways of using um, machine learning, never mind big data analysis, to try to pick up if someone is lying or not. And then on the big data side, I suspect, based on things like Facebook shares, Facebook likes, um, probably the style of language on, st on the status updates, I bet very strongly that there's a strong correlation between your age and the number of status updates, or at least maybe your mental age and your number of status updates. Um, <laughs> I'm as guilty as that as anyone. Um, but uh, I would put money on it that it is possible to um, start to de determine if you think somebody is in a certain age category based on it, their usage of Facebook. Yes. And, and there's, there's already a lot of work getting done right now, especially in the area of semantic analysis. What were your emotions like? to predict from your language, uh, from your Twitter feeds, from your Facebook feeds. Hey, what, what's the emotion of this person? Like? And, and to make the judgment that Randy talked about. I'd like to engage Pear with a question. Uh, I have a question for Okay, let's, uh, well, I'll ask my question first. I claimed it. Hey, I was enjoying myself fine. <laughs> <laughs> Pear, I was very much taken with your notion of proof of location and that this is going to be integral to the way that we do business going forward, that we'll have to prove our location as much as uh, other parts of our identity. Um, do you imagine a cottage industry arising where, say, a disgruntled professor who wasn't given tenure decides to uh, create a business where he can offer people false proofs of location um, and, and it's not so much a question of whether he can do it or not, it's more a question of scale. He can invest enormous energy in this because he can scale it up and sell on the black market such that Assad could contact this professor and say, uh, I would like to have been here during this interval of time. Huh. Can you generate that for me? Is that, is that a worry of yours? That's not such a question of technique, because I'm, I'm, I'm promising you that if this professor had the will, he, he could come up with some fairly convincing. Count me in. <laughs> <laughs> You've already got tenure. <laughs> uh, I think that's. I think that's coming, actually. Uh, the, 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 the application I worry about is this um, financial trading. You know, that's now timed. And the resolution of that timing of whose trade got there first is getting finer and finer and finer. And uh, the, the time is just estimated based on uh, GPS, just a regular GPS. So that would be a very, um, what did they used to call this? This has a history that goes back to the beginning of the century. I forget who it was, or horse races or something like that, that uh, they would delay the call of the horse race back at the booking bookies. Sure, this is the movie The Sting. Ah, okay, thank you. <laughs> Great movie, Robert Redford. <laughs> <laughs> so may maybe, maybe one solution there is you do a combination of a lot of things. So it's not just your cell phone, but your watch. Now you've got watches which have, you can put chip in there, we can tell you where exactly you are. And your password. So three or four things, I don't know. Yeah. I am um, uh, picking up on my colleague's point here. I, I spent quite a bit of time with PayPal. And uh, uh, PayPal, you know, depending if it's a $1.99 transaction, they don't check much. Uh, it, they're, they're good. They'll take the risk. $50, they start to insist on a couple of uh, items. And so location only is, uh, you know, an element in that stack. It, I don't think it can sit there by itself. But uh, even so, we want to make the attack expensive. And so that's the idea behind the Leos and the Iridiums. And, and, and even that is, is uh, 
parameterable in that if you're buying a car, not only will I check your location at the moment we sit down, we'll, I'll, I'll check just about just before we're done, five, ten minutes later. And, uh, and I think I can lock it down pretty good. But, you know, the, 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 prin the principle underlying your question is, is, is true. Uh, location-based security doesn't offer anything if the attacker has the same location you do. Then it has to come from, you know, the, the other factors. You are complicit in, in that. Uh, there were some hands over here. Um, uh, one. Um, maybe radio navigation security could be based on more than just one signal, right? Uh, you could have a sensor of, of agile. So I'm like one way to defeat just GPS-based um, secure location. If even if you just grab the raw samples, you could generate a you could generate a false location from a, a simulator, right? And so you could verify that it was um, that it was somewhere. You couldn't verify that it was at the right location, but. What if you made the attacker have to spoof all the signals in the, in the vicinity, and then that makes the attack harder, and then you can verify, well, there was a cell phone signal here, um, there was a FM radio signal here, there was so but, forth. But you're thinking only at the, so you're not thinking of security, because you're thinking only at the RF level. So let's take that RF signal back, it goes through an SGW, it goes through a GDP tunnel, and in there is the ID of your location, your longitude and latitude. That's how it works in the te telephone network, right? What about that spot? That spot's a lot easier to get to. A $9 an hour telephone tech can get it. So you don't have to go to these extreme lengths. It's really, it's every chain, right? Every chain that matters. But I mean, that, that point's very valid for some very high security assets, like UAVs flying around the sky, stopping someone smacking it into a building. Sure. And that's the exact principle behind NAVSOP. So it is indeed a seriously difficult undertaking to start spoofing uh, medium wave radio, VHF FM radio, DAB digital radio, DVB-T radio, 2G GSM, 3G GSM, Wi-Fi, 4G, GS, uh, 4G um, uh, mobile, and ADSB from downlink from aircraft. And the po point about NAVSOP learning was that it actually checks things like, do these signals all come from the same place? So um, for a high, very high value asset, like in the defense industry, then the more the merrier, and you know that's the whole point behind sensor fusion. Make it so hard for them to, uh, to to spoof you that they will stop worrying about it and try doing something else like buying bazookas. Um, but the problem was the one-trick pony of civilian GPS and the fact that you can order a GPS simulator on the internet today and it will arrive in 10 days and you can put a coat hanger in the front of it and broadcast GPS. So um, uh, I think the point though is it's similar to two-step authentication and things. But this point is absolutely right, and it comes back to my point before about all my beautiful, long, complicated passwords are actually controllable by watching me swipe my thumb across my, my smartphone. You can't get the password out, but you can access stuff while, while I'm in a, in a difficult situation. So there's multiple... A bump on your head. <laughs> Bill, you have... GPS only, right? When you bring up nope. the GPS only, you can have your cell tower tra track you, or you can have Wi-Fi tracking. So there's so many different ways of getting location. It need not be GPS only. We'll take one more question for the panel. So, you know, talking, asking the security guy, or um, maybe all of you, um, you know, we're talking a lot, Edward Snowden, right, the leaker, right, spent a lot of time talking about how he exposed what the government was doing to us. But the other thing he also exposed was what one guy could do to the government. And, and that would be true inside of Google or Yahoo or, you know, so we spent some time talking about whether Google was evil, but Google doesn't really have to be evil. You just need one guy. And I'm curious from a security perspective, does anybody know whether once, you're, once you've got the employee badge and you're inside the company, well, is, is it free reign in there inside of Google's offices or Yahoo's or Facebook's? Uh, what sort of security do they have to prevent Considering the government apparently let Edward Snowden run free reign all over the place, what's the st is Google better at that than our government? Or you know, does anyone know? Typical audit logs usually help you, right? You have to have a good audit system. A person calls in with a phone number and they have trouble. You make sure they only search for that phone number, right? You, this is typical stuff. As for Eric Snowden, um, Edward Snowden, all he did is move to Russia, and I think any one of us can do that. Uh, nothing changed, right? He, he moved to Russia, and that's it. So I don't think he, he makes a difference. I don't think he makes a difference to Google. Because as, as Todd pointed out to me, I'm not willing to give up that convenience, no matter what they put on the newspaper, so. 
Let's thank our panelists. It's been a great session. We'll now be breaking for the Mobile Monday session. And uh, before we, we break for Mobile Monday, uh, I'd like to let you know that um, one of the vendors just outside is going to be offering a free iPad, or was it an iPod? Um, and if you'll leave your, um, your business card with them, they'll be doing a selection just afterward. And it's just outside this door to your left. And uh, we'll give away one of those free as we return from the Mobile Monday. We will return um, <laughs> at 3.50. And now we want to talk about the taxes. <laughs> Send me your email because we have a, a symposium coming up on position navigation and time. Yeah, no, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't feel the need, but uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Talking about the different links to the UAV and how what what goes wrong if yeah, um, I'm just pair p e r dot e n g e at Stanford dot edu. Well, we're, we're focusing really on the, on the last one. Right? We know this is a bit. Yeah. We're working up point to point first. This is yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. People would make this up. People don't know anything. Oh, do they? No, I thought that was thinking. You were worried. Uh, but nonetheless, it is. I love Stanford. Well, I'm just looking at the sports class and the way it is. Basically, every university that told me the whole something for and that's not going yeah. to sound like yeah. one class. Yeah. I cut it there. Yeah. 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 So, uh, I was in Harvard Law School much years ago already, and it's a startup they do. Uh, and then you've got two thirds. Yeah. Well, other, other, uh, yeah. 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 Y
Rogers. Oh, great. Yeah. I mean, There's been everybody there's else hinted about this. Hinted exactly. This is this is the 800 pound gorilla. No one okay, was talking about this. I was gonna walk right up there. So yeah. Um, thank you.